two, one. The advent of the field processed shield and the las gun with their explosive interaction, deadly to attacker and attacked, placed the current determinatives on weapons technology. We need not go into the special role of atomics. The fact that any family in my empire could so deploy its atomics as to destroy the planetary bases of 50 or more other families causes some nervousness, true. But all of us possess precautionary plans for devastating retaliation. Guild and Lanzrod contain the keys which hold this force in check. No, my concern goes to the development of humans as special weapons. Here is a virtually unlimited field which a few powers are developing. Muad'Dib, lecture to the War College from the Stilgar Chronicle. Welcome back to Dune Saga, everyone. This is season two of our Dune Houses of the Lonsrod campaign. I am Eric at Maron Recluse Online, your game master for this epic multi-arc awesome adventure series, which continues tonight with our third storyline, Instruments of Canley. This program features adult situations and language and may not be suitable for all ages. Listener discretion is advised. We are Vorpal Tales, and we play a wide assortment of games seven days a week that fall into two categories, awesome adventures and terrifying tales. So be sure to check the calendar on VorpalTales.com to stay up to date with all of our shows. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dune Adventures of the Imperium in PDF format on DriveThruRPG or in physical copy at Modifius.com slash Dune. While you're on DriveThruRPG, check out some of our very own Vorpal Tales supplements, which include characters, monsters, and scenarios made for many of the games that we play weekly. Follow us on Twitch and visit our website on VorpalTales.com to find the link to join our Discord. We are on most social media outlets, including YouTube, where you can catch up on previous episodes. So remember to follow, subscribe, and hit the bell to get all the updates. Be sure to visit our Vorpal Tales sponsors and affiliates like Dungeon Crate and Gem Hammer and Sons. You can scratch that Loot Crate itch with the membership of DungeonCrate.com. Uh, every box is chock full of dice, miniatures, tabletop terrain, and original adventures perfect for your D&D campaign. Sign up for your box at DungeonCrate.com. New members can use the discount code WORPLETALESDC in all caps for $5 off their new subscription. For dice, books, magic items, and more, check out Jim Hammer and Sons at shop.gemhammer.com and make sure to check their latest Kickstarter, Rolox Guide to Violence. We want to thank Modifius Entertainment for making awesome games for us to play and for providing support for their players. Special music shoutouts go to Infraction, Mocha Music, Repulsive Sound, Machinima Sound, the whole other tabletop audio, Raspberry Music, Chris Clavenis, Patrick Lieberkind, and Blear Moon for the use of their excellent music. You can find more awesome ambient sounds and tunes over at bandcamp.com, YouTube, freesound.org, and SoundCloud. Also, we want to thank World 20 for the use of their virtual tabletop platform, perfect for us in this game. As always, we want to give a big thanks to our patrons for supporting what we do and for helping us to grow. Uh, be sure to check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash VorpalTales. Find out uh, how you too can be awesome and support what we, what we do. And last but certainly not least, thank you, all of our viewers and fans, for tuning in. Our house entourage is here and ready to engage in the deadliest of intrigues. Agents of the Imperium, remind our audience who you are, where they can find you online, and who you will be playing this evening. Beginning with Devin. Hello, all. I am Devin. You can find me online as Sword of Sully. And tonight I will be playing Ara, Bene Gesserit, Consort, and now Reverend Mother, Norma. Excellent. Jared. Jared, you're I am muted. muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, my name is Jared. Um, you can find me at the Real Life Jared on the World Wide Web, and I'll be playing Archibald. The long lost uncle that put a wrench in everything so far. I mean, <laughs> were you really long lost? We knew exactly where you were. <laughs> it's not talked long. about. Well kept. <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> Ambrose. Hey everybody, I'm Ambrose. My pronouns are he or they. You can find me all over the internet as AmChangeling because it me, AmChangeling. You can also find me on Etsy at Neat and Co Designs. And tonight I shall be playing Lysander Aphelion, whose pronouns are he, him. He is the Swordmaster of House Cheshire. Yes. 
Panda. Hey there, I am Panda. You can find me more or less in the important parts of the internet as at Vebbles. I will be playing Tia Kalu, Benny Jesuit Nanny, because we can't all be consorts and reverend mothers. Key. Hello, I'm Key Sama. You can find me on Twitter at TrueKeySama, and tonight I will be Pardo Reed, Mentat, Marshal, and Warmaster. Mm. Mm. And last but not least, Rachel. Uh, hello, my name is Rachel. Uh, if I am distracted this evening, it's because it's my first time producing. Please, nothing blow up. Um, you can <laughs> find me, Stolen Fires, pretty much everywhere. And tonight, I will be playing Lady Daphne. All right, and now for a very short recap of the previous episode. Ambrose, would you be so kind as to read the recap? Absolutely. We wait in the courtyard to meet former General Archibald Cheshire. Daphne and her uncle formally greet each other before moving to somewhere they can speak more freely. Daphne explains the situation on Snicker. She carefully offers Archibald a parole. Not a pardon, she clarifies. A parole. He would not return to his place in the house leadership, but he would be a free man. Archibald balks a little bit at that, but claims to Daphne that he's innocent of fratricide. Daphne says that's a thing to discuss if and when he can clear his name. About this time, we hear screaming and yelling on the other side of a hedge. Men in olive drab, highlighted in orange emerge from the hedges. They're armed with stun batons and other guard weapons. Lysander is the first person to pick up on the danger as they head directly for General Archibald. General, your, your time has come, they yell, as Lysander directs troops to counterattack. One attacks Norma, but she easily throws him off. Another one goes for Davos. Davos realizes they're also going for the Ornithopter. He grabs Archibald and starts moving carefully to the ornithopter. Daphne yells, Uncle, wait, and dashes off in a direction separate from where Davos and Archibald have headed, convincing one of the people attacking the ornithopters to leave the launching pad. Norma dashes to the ornithopter as Lysander's soldiers heroically sacrifice themselves to cover our retreat, aka Ambrose rolls very poorly. Archibald secretly communicates with a few more Cheshire soldiers, instilling them with a loyal fervor. As the prison guards fight the interlopers, Pardo thinks a little bit long-term. He decides to fight alongside Lysander, partly to protect him and partly to help absolve him of suspicion of disloyalty. He skillfully manipulates the battlefield to this outcome. Davos continues bringing General Archibald to the Ornithopter as the soldiers and wardens continue fighting. Damn it, says Lysander, as he takes off after Daphne. He sees someone about to attack her and intervenes, stabbing him with a long blade. Daphne continues running, retrieving the body of one of the attackers to examine him later. She notices a tattoo on him, identifying him as a soldier for House Cheshire. That's when the air is full of spores. Daphne is paralyzed, though Norma can use her Bene Gesserit training to throw off the effects. Unfortunately, Archibald fails to sneak in onto the ornithopter. One of his attackers spots him and shoots, but Archibald responds by cracking his ribs, kneeing him in the gut, and bringing his elbow down on the spine, and then takes his gun away, and then shoots him with his own gun. Unfortunately, running out of ammo, however. Pardo ends up getting stabbed by one of the attackers. Nicely done! He compliments the fighter before disemboweling him. Meanwhile, Davos leaps into the ornithopter when he spots the spores being dispersed and knocking Daphne down. 
Another attacker tries to get into the ornithopter, but Davos expertly banks him into the wings. Amateur, he mutters. Lysander, seeing Daphne collapse, dashes to her, avoiding the purple spores. He heads straight to the thopter. I trying not to say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> Norma assumes the gunner's position and begins exchanging fire with our attackers. That's when the giant shadow cats begin leaping over the hedges and going to town on basically anyone they can catch. The spores begin to wear off as the ornithopter is ready to take off. General Archibald is among the prisoners being re-rounded up, and Daphne says they're taking custody of him now. Shaken by the effect of the spores on her body, Daphne is shaken and orders Davos to leave immediately. On the ride back to the capital, Pardot takes the time to thank the soldier who saved him. As we land, Davos has a brief exchange with Daphne, making it clear he's ready, willing, and able to space anyone who proves inconvenient. Daphne thanks him, but kin killing is a grave sin. We have a formal welcome back home. Melas's eyes are full of venom as we arrive. The Duchess is ready to receive you as soon as we get you out of those clothes, he says, indicating Archibald's prison clothes. Archibald agrees and says he will appear in clothes befitting his status. As he moves through the castle, the jungle cats are clearly happy to see him again. Lysander is summoned to meet with the Duchess and Gwilion. Whatever just happened at the garden, I'm trusting both of you to watch General Archibald very closely and report back to me. In the hours before dinner is served, Daphne takes the time to carefully select the clothes which will convey power and authority. Archibald is led to his formal quarters where everything is as he left it. He goes to his desk, opening the false bottom in one of the drawers where he can read an old love letter from his betrothed. He also dresses carefully, intent on conveying his current value to the house. Pardo tends his wounds, then seeks out Archibald to introduce himself and has a brief conversation. Davos sends a brief message to his Arrakis contact, Iblis, checking in on him and making arrangements for a soft landing for House Cheshire when we arrive in person. Norma goes to visit the Duchess. She seems anxious and conflicted with Archibald back in the castle. Norma comforts her as best she can. It's time for dinner. The dining room is decorated with portraits of the historical leaders of House Cheshire. All eyes are drawn to Archibald when he enters, and he is directed to sit at the end of the table. Every time he looks up, he sees the faces of his supposed victims looking back at him. Well, he expected this. The first course is rattlesnake soup served cold. Well, it's better than prison food. This is followed by a series of similarly passive-aggressive dishes. Though there is melange spiced coffee for dessert. At least Ashes the Shadow Cat remembers him. Daphne holds court during the meal, while Pardo keeps up the small talk and Davos tells extremely exaggerated stories about what Arrakis is like. Norma and Archibald have an extensive conversation, attempting to warm him up and cultivate him as an ally. At the end of dinner, it's time to talk business. Adelaide explains the situation and that General Archibald is one of the few people who can possibly get through to them. In the middle of the discussion, the Duchess is interrupted by a servant. She takes Daphne with her to the war room, where we're shown the archival footage of Archibald, supposedly sabotaging Federico's thopter. Part of the footage involves him being attacked by a shadow cat and shooting back in self-defense. He then begins undoing the conduits supporting the wings. Pardo asks for time to study the footage. 
He's suspicious of Face Dancer involvement, especially as the Shadow Cat was hostile to Archibald. The Duchess's face falls. Thank you for reading, Ambrose, and thank you to Rachel for writing these excellent recaps, as always. And now we, we can continue with our current story, Instruments of Canvey. We shall begin uh, back where we sort of left off, where everyone was having dinner, uh, and they were just, some of the guests were uh, still in the banquet hall, while Daphne, uh, Adeline, and uh, like Pardo were present to watch the pieces and, and uh, clips of the video that was taken over 15 years ago. That was just recently dug up from the archives. Let's see here. So after viewing the tape, you see uh, Adeline, you know, kind of nods when Pardo tells her that he's going to study the tapes further. Uh, and she sort of tables the, the rest of the discussion. It's like, all right, well, we're going to need to take a look at this tomorrow. For now, finish. Let I don't feel like going back and eating dinner. Take care of our guests, she says to Daphne. And then, you know, she kind of makes this motion like she's going to retire for the rest of the evening. Um, and she lets you carry on as you want to, uh, leaving Archibald and the rest of the entourage back in the banquet hall. Uh, everybody's sort of like reclining back and it's a little tense in there uh with, especially with the uh, the duchess or maybe not as as tense as before with the duchess not having left uh although old Melis is still there sort of like surveying the the dinner uh the party as it were standing up and you know standing near a corner uh by the doorway uh, so adeline sort of retires and goes to her chambers to, to dwell on you know seeing what she just saw she was never actually privy to that information until now uh, she was too young at the time that her father and her uh, her sister died so she never actually saw that that footage um, but eventually you all go back and uh, you finish dinner unless there's something specific that each, any one of you want to do in particular after Adeline uh, retires to, for the rest of the evening it seems that she doesn't want to talk to uh, her uncle at the moment I, I do um I'd like to, I know there's probably some um, of my old guard that are obviously still loyal to me. Mm -hmm. Could I possibly contact them and maybe get four or five of my uh, Varangian guards back? Oh, that's easily done. I mean, the, the Jabberwock and Castle Cheshire in general is chock full of your old, uh, some of the old soldiers that you that served underneath you. Uh, a lot of a lot of them were at some of them were at the prison, and a lot of them apparently went to uh, the Moon of Snicker uh, to uh, help with the the production of ornithopters. After the whole uh, scandal went down, there was kind of like a split between the people who served underneath you, some that believed what what was presented to them in that in the form of that video, and some that vehemently. Uh, denied that you committed those crimes. Uh, they considered you a, a person of high moral fiber, right? Like they didn't believe mm. that you were capable of uh, such a heinous crime. And for what? For power? For you know, just to be the next one in line uh, for you know command of the of the house? It was something. It was. It actually came of a. Uh, the whole scandal came as a shock because House Cheshire does, just didn't have that kind of re reputation. Uh, although after that, uh, it seems that you know, that's sort of one thing that kind of went with House Cheshire's name is ruthlessness after this uh, this supposed crime. And then what ended up happening later on with uh, Daphne's sister, Alicia, uh, there was this air of uh, this connotation that House Cheshire is pretty cunning, but they can also be very ruthless, not just to their enemies, but even to their own. So yeah, you have uh, soldiers that you can rely on, that you can recruit to your side uh, pretty much anytime you want to. Uh, okay. And that can be reflected mechanically in on your character sheet where I believe you have a specific name for the troop, uh, like this vanguard that you have with you. Yep. Um, the Varangian Guard, do you want me to give their history now or? I mean, you can, yeah. If you want to like uh, bring 
us on uh, what you imagined uh, this this uh, vanguard being like. Well, the uh, uh, the idea behind it was that the ranging guard actually in history were the best and brightest of the uh, bodyguards of the Jarls back in the Viking times and stuff like that. So they were actually the personal bodyguards and they were the best warriors that were there. And they specialize in the uh, the shield and uh, the cis, not the cis knives, but the uh, I can't remember the shield, the energy shield, but it's different. So oh, it's the Holtzman shield, yeah, the personal yeah, body you. shields. Yeah, mm -hmm. but instead of like, um, no, there was one that would act like it was a physical shield on your arm, correct? Uh, in some Doom. cultures in the Imperium actually still use the old shields, like straight up like uh, bucklers and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, well, no, because I know there was an energy shield that was actually like a legit shield, not like the. Mechanical oh, no. give you either a partial shield or mm -hmm. a full shield, and the partial ones yeah. are for dueling and stuff, and tend to give you more mobility. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, Thea has a half shield. Yeah. Anyways, um, they're basically outfitted to where they have the actual body shield plus. Um, back in the day, Archibald actually did uh, um, research on this specific shield to be able to, set, to have a separate shield that actually looked like an actual, like, Viking shield. Oh, so it's a half shield that yeah. is... Okay, okay. Correct. It's, it's, yeah. it's a type of half shield then that basically just you wear it on your sleeve or on the back of your hand or what have you. And yeah, you just, just like a traditional you, you, shield. You could, you could move it wherever you like. So when in combat, uh, or at least in a duel, it would be considered an asset that sits on that hand as, is, as its uh, zone. Okay, okay that, that's cool. That's an interesting idea. So yeah, you have you can you can go in your time on the castle. You can say that uh, in your spare time, you can go around and sort of start re-recruiting your vanguard and putting them back together, so to speak. Gotcha. Um, okay. Does anybody else want to do anything after, as you're finishing up the dinner uh, for the evening? Uh, Daphne's just going to do what her mom said and, like, uh, essentially play the part of hostess, hopefully so well that she could just sort of deflect any questions about what the fuck just happened. <laughs> yeah, you're a little shaken as uh, having seen that. You're just like, well, that was not how I was expecting dinner to go tonight, but okay. <laughs> Uh, it sure looked like your uncle was sabotaging that doctor, and it, it, like it, it just you're you can imagine what your mother is going through right now. But uh, most anybody who saw that, who you know has uh, any sense of um, uh, history with House Cheshire, probably has like a, a roller coaster of emotions going on right now. Like the you know they saw footage, undeniable footage that this person who's sitting in their dining room actually really did sabotage this doctor and cause the deaths of you know all these people and stuff. Um, uh, well, this, uh, all this is going on, I am quietly teaching the children how to snoop at a level that is appropriate to teach them when you are in a small position and not included at the table. How do you gather information? That is what we're doing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kind of um, like the sound of music, but with more bugs. Yeah, <laughs> that, that reminds me. Daphne would also like to watch everybody else who just watched that clip and sort of see if she can pick anything up about their mm. emotional state. Oh, you get it's it's a little difficult to pick up anything from Pardo just because he's a mentat and he's like constantly like analyzing and focusing on what's going on. So you know, his his emotions are all like underneath his. I, I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, Key, uh, are just sort of like subdued and especially when he's like uh, tasked with like analyzing something and he's like deep into it. As for your mother, she's an open book. You can tell she's really, you know, sort of uh, uh, disgusted at, and just sort of disturbed at and seeing this footage for the first time. Uh, she had tasked her aides to dig up this footage as soon as as, she, as soon as they could, but she it, it's kind of telling that she didn't want to look at this for the last fifteen years, the for the entire imprisonment of of your uncle. Uh, almost like as if she didn't want to believe it, perhaps. 
and now that she's being confronted with the reality it's it's disturbing her on a, on a very visible level uh, such that she has to just sort of turn away and not view it any longer okay that's about what i expected uh what about omelas what what's uh what's his countenance like Omelas had actually seen this before because he was the Mentat at the time that this took place. Mm -hmm. uh, Omelas has served House Cheshire for generations, so he's already well aware of what it is, and if, uh, he's he you already kind of know how he feels about the general just based on his body language and the way he was, you know, like observing everyone at the at the uh, at the dining hall. Uh, he doesn't hold any special love for the general given the circumstances. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, all right. And as you're teaching the children to be observant, uh, Thea, uh, Masam just kind of nods in agreement, And uh, Balanda is, you know, she's like, we're always observant, you know? And she's like making small little observations about Davos. Like he's purposely being rude and obnoxious. She makes the observation. <laughs> Uh, uh, Davos, uh, the old pirate, is sitting next to Archibald, just kind of ribbing him, going, hey, hey, so let me tell you about those worms on Arrakis, huh? And he's just uh, going off on these tall tales. Masam, on the other hand, just, just you know, he's kind of used to observing people and doing this sort of thing. So your right. advice just kind of rolls right off of him, but he makes, a, he makes a very odd observation. And he kind of leans in close to you and he's like, do you smell burning? Is something burning? Um, let's see what seated perception I have to throw some Benny Gesserit love into that. Uh, I'll give it to you for free. Yeah, you don't have to roll. I mean, you're you you uh, you're pretty. Your senses are pretty acute, uh, and everything that was served here, you know, smelled of something, but it certainly wasn't burning. Uh, even though like part of the high end wolf was braised, it didn't come off as burnt at all, and there's no like lingering odor as such. So you're not sure where he's getting this notion that uh, there's something burning. Uh, it, you look around, and nobody else seems to get the sense of, that, that there's this uh, uh, odor in the in the room that something's burning. Yeah, I'm assuming that what he's getting is some sort of cue of either something that might happen and it's how his intuition is choosing to determine it or he's something in the room is not supposed to be there that's kind of chemically smell and pop into my sheet you don't smell anything but Masam is like it's just it's it's a weird burning smell he says Does he know like what a... it's smelling like when he's thinking about it burning um, I'm going to attempt to... It's a hard call whether or not I'd be using my empathy ability to try to understand what he means. Um, mm. Including, I could use understand physical empathy, reading him to try to get what that is, or I could use communicate empathy, or if I'd be using my bodyguarding battle specialty to try to figure out if this is a threat. I think it's more plausible, given that I know that more things could go wrong in this dinner, and that, for example, the burning may be a reaction to a flavor he's got, I'm going to do just a bodyguarding test, and I'm supposed to match that with one of my um, things. Um, yeah, you pair your skill with the, with your drive. Uh, but that gives you the target number, and when you click the skill, um, you tell how many dice. In this case, it would be two dice. Uh, and any, more successes, the better. But if you roll a 20, you get a complication. Okay, and I'm going to use duty because um, the care of others is the found. The person is formed from the care of others. I'm doing this on behalf of someone else. Okay, that makes sense. How many dice? Two dice. Submit. Yeah. Using focus. Yes. Shaboop. Rolly, 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 rolly. You rolled a 15 oh. and a 11. So you got one success, no complications. Mm -hmm. uh, one second. You, uh, you don't sense anything and you try to get him to like describe what it is that he's smelling. And um, I'm gonna say because you rolled battle, that you've been in situations where you've smelled 
uh, what is tantamount to burning human flesh, and what he the way that Masam is describing what he's experiencing uh, seems to fit that to a T. You hesitate correcting him on what he is smelling, since he is obviously ignorant to what that actually smells like. So basically, pork. <laughs> Someone has overcooked this... the pork. You know what? <laughs> this is the harsh, terrible world, and as much as children deserve a certain degree of protection from it, if he's going to survive, he's going to need to know what that's like, and I would ask him questions that would allow him to lead to um, that possibly, if not people, making him think about if it smells like food, what would it be? Since I don't have any immediate, this is dangerous and I should tell people. He probably says something like, uh, slig meat? I don't, you know, which is like hybrid slug and pig meat. These weird creatures in the Dune universe that eat garbage and have like the taste super sweet. Like, oh, it's like a delicacy or whatever. Uh, he's like, I guess. What else would people slig? want to burn at this party? <laughs> you can't imagine what else. It's just a, it's just, it's a, it's a typical sort of like, uh, dinner at the the uh, house Cheshire Castle, so uh, it doesn't seem like there was anything else that was overly cooked. Yeah, there was a flambe <laughs> composed. Flambe of would the, smell uh, faintly of burned alcohol in like a correct. distant way, so that's not mm -hmm. it. The player here is stumped at what this possibly means, mm -hmm. but it's definitely being filed as something to be concerned about, and Mossum is being observed. And there's a part of me that's slightly concerned that we may have someone who's a little bit further along on the ben, um, the whole Quasac Hatterick breeding program, and he may be getting um, a little bit of prophecy. Mm. So this will that's be going in some Benny Gesserit report at some point. Oh, undoubtedly. You see, it, it, it continues even after the dinner's adjourned, and you know, you leave the the hall and everything. He still like kind of makes a face when he walks out into the hallways and stuff, and he kind of covers his nose. But Landa's just like you know, ambling along without a care in the world. She's kind of like, yeah, what's going on over here? And you know, just making observations and checking things out. Uh, unless there's anybody. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Ask Mossum when he goes to sleep to tell me what he dreams about. Because surely these people have, um, given the amount of Benny Gesserit training, have the simple knack of remembering your dreams. And that, if he's got a brain blender like everybody else, that's where all the stuff that he's processing is going to show up with more pieces. You say that to him, and he just looks at you, and he's like, I, I'd rather not. And to which Tia basically makes a note that there is stuff going on in his dreams that is clearly important. And with that, he, that's... Uh goes to his room. He goes to the I don't chamber. pressure him. Instead, I up the maternal love and care. <laughs> you tell him, like, oh, make sure you get some rest and we'll wake up nice and early tomorrow to do the exercises. And he's like, yes, yes. I know. And he turns around and stomps into his room. And I'm aiming even a little bit further that I'm almost... Because he's had such an instability in his life, and because I know he, he misses his mother, but also because he would have been uprooted between a lot of caretakers, I'm providing him with a little bit of the regressive care, so the opportunity to regress a little bit, because children who've been traumatized tend to need that, that they mm. tend to backslide a bit, and he's been asked to grow up way too fast, and everyone else has been like, you're going to be like super under control, so this kid's got trauma, I am basically unpicking the trauma is my job here. Yeah, you're starting to. Him. Yeah, you're starting to get a little more of a crystallized uh, look at, at this kid just from having spent just a week or two with him uh, on a hayliner mm -hmm. on the ca in the castle on the castle grounds and stuff. Uh, yeah, you're starting to get mm -hmm. a, a real crystallized look at who this kid is and what he's been through. It's starting to put the pieces together little by little. Um, but did anybody else want to do anything for the rest of the evening before turning in or resuming business as usual tomorrow with the usual sort of strategy meeting? So Norma would, uh, after dinner, uh, start wandering the hallways until she stops at a guard, turns, says, William. Norma. And and then, of course, communicating in wonderful secret language because we never speak fully, uh, requests information of him 
because she doesn't typically directly ask him and says, uh, your face dancers, has it ever been known that animal instinct has seen through your guys? That is a, uh, that is something that we cannot control, not fully. We can appear the part in certain aspects of their genetics, uh, match for match for the, uh, for the real art, for the genuine article, as it were, but there's always something about animals that have a sixth sense, not necessarily just a scent. They know when something is wrong. Perhaps Pardo does have some validity to that claim that it really wasn't. William wasn't there, so he just kind of arches his eyebrows like, do you know something I don't know, Reverend Mother? And I just say, watch the hollow vid. You'll see. <laughs> I know he knows nods. what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> He nods, he resumes his watch, quote unquote. And you see, just as, as he's doing so, and you start leaving, you hear the doors to the, uh, um, you, you see the doors to the banquet hall open up, and you see Archibald and everybody starting to come out, and he starts, you know, just watching Archibald as he makes his way through the, the castle, meeting old soldiers and shaking hands with them and stuff. Um, what about, uh, Lysander, do you kind of like uh, go back to uh, your doing your duties? Uh, do you kind of slip away while no one else is watching and uh, do your tasks, as it were? Yes. All right. Um, Archibald, you're going through the castle and you're making, uh, you know, you're trying to uh, reacquaint yourself with the, the troops that you had under your control once upon a time, and you know that you're being watched. And moreover, you know that you're being followed. But in one case, you kind of know, you kind of get an idea of who it is. Like, oh, it's probably, you know, uh, Daphne's bodyguard or whatever, the sword master. But in other cases, you're not sure who else is, is shadowing you around. Like, they, they're always just out of your view as you're just kind of turning the corner and looking and stuff like that. You know you're being watched very, very closely. Uh, is there anything specific that you do, or do you just kind of like play the role of, of the uh, of the guest and uh, uh, go back to your quarters after dinner? I'm going to yell. You know, if you have questions, you can always just ask me. There's no reason to no. be a thief in the thief in the night about it. <laughs> no response you figure they get the message then. yep the rest of the evening goes by somewhat uh uneventful uh a few hours after the dinner however there's an alarm that goes off it's a blaring alarm that's deep uh, you know in the bowels of the of castle cheshire but you hear it reverberating throughout the walls All, most of you hear it it's a fire alarm anybody who steps out in the hallway can smell smoke what do you do beginning with um ooh, who goes first and move here uh davos is not there julian lissander you're up first uh immediately going to make sure that lady daphne and the duchess are safe and evacuate them Evacuate. So you go through like fire safety evacuations and stuff like that. Like get them to you know the situation room or whatever the bunker. <laughs> um, yes. You go there and uh, you you have like a, this little tiny thing that that you know it's like a tiny little uh, dot that sits just on behind your ear, uh, which is generally where you receive a lot of the chatter, the comm chatter from the guards, uh, and you hear it's like a you know you kind of like check in with them to see what's going on as you start heading over moving quickly towards where uh daphne and adeline are, are at in their wing of the castle and you hear the chatter coming in it's like it's okay i think we have it under control there was a fire in the kitchen how do you proceed 
he will still carry on just in case um, someone has used this as a dis distraction to in in some form or another. Yeah. Good call, good call. Yeah, you move through and like you're just like my lady and you're racing. You start like collecting them and you see out of line like, what is this noise all about? And it's like a <laughs> and it's like, oh, there's a fire, you know, we need to go. And the, out in the hallway, there's already a, a group of troops that are ready to move with you at any point in time, your own personal guard. Uh, so you escort the lady and, and Daphne down, down a ways uh, to, to a secure room and until they actually give you the go ahead and they've managed to like clear the uh, the trouble. Uh, next, uh, Norma. Uh, so would I be informed that it was in the kitchen as well? Yes, there's something happened. Yeah, everybody who had okay. communion at, uh, yeah, asset would probably be aware of what's going on elsewhere in the house. Uh, although, any ask any guard that's like jogging down the hallway, heading towards like the uh, the Reach's familiar wing of the castle, and they'll tell you like just fire downstairs, you know, and they they're rushing to try to like secure uh, the nobility. Uh, what do you do? Uh, what important rooms are located basically the exact opposite wing of where this fire is occurring? It's actually kind of like right stock in the middle, in the center of the castle, like where you would have like the um, uh, the dining area. Uh, directly beneath that floor is where they have like the kitchens and stuff like that. That's where they're, you're hearing this chatter about like this fire taking place. It was contained inside of the kitchen. Hmm. Norma would begin scouting around the uh, important information areas of the castle to see if somebody had been uh, setting this to lure it away or lure guards away from it perhaps uh sure yeah you start uh, you start data. heading down you start heading down there yeah all right uh lady daphne are you staying put with uh, lysander and the rest of the troop on your side of the wing uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Lysander, but no. Um, <laughs> she, God damn it. She's not sneaking away. No one. No she's one not sneaking saw that away, coming. but she does say uh, to keep Lady Adelaide safe. But uh, she wants to go check on the safety of everyone else in the castle and see what exactly happened in the kitchen that was so bad it triggered a castle wide fire alarm. Yeah. If you must, don't go alone. Please. You can always come with me. <sighs> He'll look to uh, the Duchess to see what she requests of him. The Duchess uh, just nods, like, go with my daughter. You know, I'm fine. No, Melis is, is with her as, long, as well as her personal guard. She's like, let's go. Um, Archibald. You hear the alarms too. I am actually, I'm going to not so much. I am going to head towards the kitchen where it's at. But what I want to look for is I want to see if there's anyone that's walking the opposite way, like any soldiers that are running the opposite way, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, or I'd also like to observe to see if there's anyone anyone that's fairly suspicious that could be caused or using this as a distraction to go somewhere. You see a guard turn a corner and their face change. You don't know if that's William or one of William's people. Or an intruder. I'm going to follow him. They're heading towards the uh, uh, the um, wing where the, the Duchess and the rest of the uh, nobility is located typically. You follow them. I need you to give me a movement roll, please. Okie doke. See, Lysander, sometimes not being in the nobles' room is the safe choice. <laughs> two successes. You need what? to do two successes. What'd you get? Uh, give me a minute. You said move, right? Oh, shit. Move plus <laughs> what? Uh, move plus your whatever drive you cheat. You 
Okay. This is going to be a truth. This screams truth. Makes sense, yeah. Two dice. Uh, focus if I... Okay, no, I don't have focus. Come on, win. Oh, yes! Two successes. <laughs> Perfect. Right on the money. All yes. right, so you, this person, whoever they are, are pretty sharp. They, they immediately sense that you're following them, and they kind of turn around like this, and you just kind of flatten yourself against the wall, and you wait for them to pass. And as everybody's running the other way, you take a breath, and you peek back out, and they've already turned around and started moving at a quicker pace. They have a weapon in their hand. Thea. So, I have this double thing that I believe Mossum is pretty traumatized and needs a little chance to regress and have a safe space, but also this kid is damn certain that he's a grown-up now and he gets to do things. So guess what two kids have someone show up with both, just not talked anywhere obvious, but just in case, the appropriate medical supplies for a burn kit, um, mm. and otherwise <laughs> checking up on them, and then Mossum gets to be asked what does he think would be the right thing to do. Yeah, you, you're you're like you hear the you you smell the faint uh, whiff of smoke and you hear the alarm, the klaxons going off down the hallways and stuff, and you're like, oh shit, let me go make check on the kids. And just as you're you're preparing yourself, like you're, you're changing your outfit or whatever, you hear Mossum scream in the next room over. In I go. It's not going to be at any speed. I'm assuming he's going to be having a nightmare, not actually getting assailed. But regardless, um, that's where I need to be. Okay. You move quickly and swiftly out of your quarters, and uh, model, you, model, model, model. <laughs> as fast as you can, uh, you put your your hand on the palm lock and the door swing, you know, slow open, and you see he's just kind of like half awake, half asleep, uh, like sitting up in his bed, and like his hands are just kind of like this, like over his face, uh, like he just saw something terrible. Um. I begin a different lit litany. It's not the Bene Gesserit litany against fear. It is a more child version one designed for recentering the person in the now and for mm. people whose visions have screwed them up a little bit. It is reminiscent of almost a lullaby or a thing that you would use on a child who'd had a waking nightmare. Hmm. You are and here, you are present. Yeah, it's something along those lines like you're- You are it, here, like a, you are present, but it's also grounding information that's something else to focus on that is very directly into the room and the environment you're in. Listen to my voice, focus on my voice. You're doing that, that bit. Okay, cool. And even beyond that, um, you feel the blanket and the softness and the blanket was made here and this was that and grounding you in the reality of it, like mundanities but comforting ones. Hmm. Yeah, you you uh, you you use your uh, your training to the best of your ability, and you actually manage to, to kind of like calm him. And he still has his eyes closed, and eventually they flash open. And they see you, and they're like, and he, he seems a little bit startled for a moment, and he's shaking. Uh, but you calm him. You grab a hold of his hands, and you just you speak to him steadily with the, you know good cadence. And eventually, he just sort of like he he starts controlling his breathing, and he starts he calm visibly calms down. But it looks like he just saw something terrible and then he just w woke up from it. And he's looking around and he's like, smoke, he says. Pardo. Pardo is dashing to wherever we kept that footage of Archibald. Hmm. Very, very interesting choice, Pardo. Uh, give me a move check, please. And with the talent intense study, I may use understand instead of another skill once per scene. So I intend Excellent. to do so. It's and a good choice. Hmm, using duty, what must be done must be done. I must run ho run over there and get this. It's the only well it's the done. only way to prove he's innocent, to prove Archibald's innocence. Excellent choice uh so you actually get there at your you're going down this hallway and you see somebody walking the complete opposite direction of where the klaxons are coming from uh this person kind of puts a hand uh on a palm lock the door to the uh, war room slides open it's 
William. He walks into the room. You follow? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. Mm -mm. Archibald, you see two people now in the war room. Uh, one that appeared to be some sort of face dancer, and following closely uh, behind him is Pardo Reed. Does the face dancer see me? They haven't seen you yet, no. You made your roll, so he did, the, the face dancer did not, in fact, notice you were following. Okay. I'm going to let the scene play out for right now. Okay. Um, I am going to keep following him, though. I want to know what this guy's up to. There's definitely you want to stay. You want to stay outside the the war room and just listen, or like, what are you doing? Watching and listening. Okay. You because I want to. I want to gauge Pardo the way Pardo is too, and I want to know what his actual feelings are about me, mm -hmm. and if he actually thinks I did this. Okay. Lysander, well, you make it down to the kitchens. Uh, where the source of the smoke was was happening. Uh, there's a house security troop there, part of uh, Pardo's, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking glass tr uh, soldiers are there, like these uh, these uh, marshals are there, and they're like, the wardens are looking over the, what seems to be the charred remains of a person. Do we you know arrive... Sorry, uh, I'm oh, guessing sorry. you went in, in the company of Lady Daphne. You didn't go independently ahead, right? Correct. Okay, so you both arrive roughly around the same time, uh, and you see standing there is uh, these looking glass wardens and William. And you see, he sees you walking in the door. He locks eyes with you, Lysander, and it's like it's taken care of. It was, uh, but you shouldn't be here, my lady. You, what happened? Assassin, he says, and he looks down to the burned corpse on the floor. He's like, we caught him easily enough. Tried to take out the doctor. And he looks over to the, the far side of the room. You see there's a couple people there, like, tending to the doctor. Like somebody assaulted him. Dr. Sloan, that is. The body is so badly burned. I'm certain any it's almost unrecognizable. evidence of who sent him is burned with him. We took care of him. You said you see uh William said I was telling the doctor and noticed somebody was when I moved closer they revealed themselves. They tried to take him out with this and, and he holds up like a uh, poison dagger, like a little stiletto, and at the at the at the uh, hilt of it there is uh, some uh inscription of some sort, like a design, a white diamond, which you know very well to be associated with House Carol. That is almost too convenient. I'm sorry, <laughs> you see William say. He doesn't seem to understand what you're getting at. Either House Carol wants to show how well they can penetrate our defenses with an assassin, or someone else wants us to think that they can. Perhaps so. And he's like, um, it's alright, we have things under, under control now. It's like it's, we only sent one assassin. <laughs> Pitiful, he says, and kind of like resheathes his or reholsters his needler gun. Doctor, are you okay? And she kind of nods his head like this, and he makes a motion for uh, Lady Daphne uh, to approach. I will. I didn't get to tell you, uh, Princess, but um, I think they might be trying to silence me, not just because I defected. Because I know where they're keeping your sister. And they're not keeping her on Nyush, as you may have previously thought. Mm -hmm. They've pre they, in prior times they had me flown out to her, to a facility where they're keeping her captive. But they're 
our experiments using those uh, Ixian probes. I think perhaps they didn't want me to relay this information to you. You may want to tread carefully against House Carol at this point. They will most likely assume that I've already given you all the information I have to give. I see. And she's on a facility in Ix. No, uh, she tells you, uh, he tells you that the, the facility itself is on one of Niusha's moons. Uh, it's like this little facility that they have where they basically keep prisoners. Like, think of like a penal colony kind of thing. Like, almost, almost like a prison, but like it's mainly there just for them to uh, play with their toys, you know, conduct experiments and so on. All right. Well, thank you for telling me. Thank you for protecting me, my lady, he says. Uh, you know, motioning towards uh, Gwilion and, and the uh, the armed soldiers present. Uh, with that being said, uh, Lysander, would you stay with the... Uh, uh, with Daphne and the rest of the, the crew here in the, in the galley until it gets uh, cleaned up? Yes, but... Uh... He would like to survey this scene um, using she's loading using if possible mm -hmm. tactics from battle. Yes, roll that. And I think Of course, duty, because it's kind of his thing. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, I got two successes, a 10 and a 12. Yeah. Target oh, very good. Okay, yeah, uh, so you got two successes. You know, just from looking at the at the the effort that House Carol expended to try to kill the Soup Doctor, like this looks sloppy, like really sloppy. Uh, and you you know you know a feint when you're looking at one. This isn't the real threat. Can I use my danger sense to see if there is a danger in this kitchen at this very moment? Yes, you may. That is an understand roll. Again, duty to protect the lady. Yes, focus. Uh, three successes. Three successes? Yeah. <laughs> way more than what you needed. So you get some additional uh, momentum here. I'll move you to that page here. I'll give you one, one extra momentum here. Yeah. You don't sense any danger in this room currently. Uh, like you feel like everybody here is exactly who. Oh geez, uh, everybody here is exactly who they say they are. Uh, I'm just oh dear. Things are being summoned. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you're like we're safe here, but what about the rest of the castle? And that's when your your mind starts, you know, churning as to who might actually be the target here. Or what might be the target? Norma. Yes. <laughs> Where are you in all this? Uh, like I said, I was looking through uh, for information they might be trying to uh, break into. So, uh, there's any other large server areas aside from for server areas for information? storage rooms for uh say like crystal slates and such uh yeah there's the uh, redulian crystals uh, that are are capped in the the records area uh which is almost always near or inside of the the war room where they where a lot of the records are kept that's where uh, pardo was taken during the dinner to be shown the the tapes of uh, archibald sh uh, sabotaging the thopter so you start heading over in that direction yeah your hyper awareness picks up that you're not alone in this very vacant seeming corridor. Somebody's watching, and you easily make out that we haven't 
the uh, silhouette of General Archibald just staring and watching, listening intently. Uh, the doorway to the war room. The war room, you notice, is the, the lights for which are on. So there's somebody inside. How do you proceed? I would like to uh, stealthily walk up next to Archibald in a way that he will not even notice that I'm right behind him so that I can get a good view inside and see what's going on along with him. All right. The woman in all black approaches you, Archibald, in the shadows of this dingy hallway, and you, uh, how do you respond? I do notice it, correct? Oh, yes. Okay. I'm going to use the eye language and put my finger up. Part, and I'm going to say Pardo is with the face dancer in here. With my eyes. Mm, nice solid communication. Yeah, he was mm -hmm. he was walking the other way. He was about to do something and was headed towards the Duchess and Duchy's room. All right. We'll respond. We'll respond. Uh, uh, yeah, stay quiet. Let us see what. Uh, they have to say before we intrude. Okay, so you listen into the doorway. Uh, Daphne, are you staying put for right now with uh, Lysander and the doctor and William? Uh, yeah, uh, I think Lysander is about to peel off. He would let Lady Daphne know what he's observed. Because even though he needs to protect you, he knows that you are very capable of causing some <laughs> delightful damage to enemies. <laughs> so probably using the eye language, he would let you know what he's figured out. Uh, yeah, in that case, I think Daphne's gonna uh, think that, oh shit, they're probably after either Archibald or my mother. Mm. And so she is gonna go find where either of them are. Excellent. So you go to ba you you start heading out, uh, presumably with Lysander to backtrack to where your mother's chambers are. Yeah, or the safe room where they they're gonna put her. Gotcha. Okay. Um. Archibald just went. Thea. You no. see Mossum. <laughs> Mossum is just like, I... the walls exploded. I I saw them. They're all dead. They... They're going to die, he says, and he looks up at you, realizing that he his senses are giving him glimpses of things that are to come, uh, such as the, the smoke from the fire downstairs and the dream that he just had, this nightmare. Uh, he describes it to you in, in vivid detail, how the walls exploded on, on uh, Castle Cheshire and it became under attack. How uh, one of the first ones that he found face down dead was um, was you, and Belanda. He followed the trail of destruction all the way upstairs, all the way over to, the, to uh, Lady Adeline's personal chambers and saw the Lady Daphne with a blossom of blood on her dress, face down with, the, with a silhouette standing behind her, having just withdrawn the blade slowly from her back. Somebody else in the, in the room, along with the, the now dead Duchess laying on the floor next to her daughter, grunts and falls to their knees he was, un he was not able to identify them. But whoever they are, they coughed up blood. And somebody else stood behind them as well, run ran their blades straight through their chest. When he tries to recall their face, he can't. Because every time he tries to focus on the face that he saw falling forward onto the floor, it was a different face every single time. First it was Lysander, then it was Norman, and Pardot, and Archibald. 
faces that were never the same. Probably Two a trailers. face cancer. And now is time for Benny Gesserit tutorial in So You're Having Prophetic Dreams, How to Interpret, <laughs> including what were the environment like? Instead of focusing on the faces and trying to get those exact details, try to move a step back. Do you see any weather cues? What were the decorations? Mm. What seasonal markings? Because it's all very well and good to know at some point Castle Cheshire will be attacked, but if you try to give that as a prophecy, people will be, yes, water wet, mm -hmm. um, yeah. orange Bible Catholic. Um, so I'm going to see if I can work with him um, to develop his talent and get him to be able to give something more than uh, beware of face dancer not being mm -hmm. one being stabbed, face dancer not bad guy. <laughs> Seems to be what this is communicating um, to people that he feels like he should recognize will be involved in stabbing other people. They apparently care enough about this to um, kill me and um, the random other Benny Gesserit, so I'm assuming they must either have something against Benny Gesserit or something against him. You remember as, as you're trying to figure this out, you start running in the back of your mind the fact that uh, Mother Superior sent you here because she was afraid for his safety because the Bene Gesserit was encountering what, what was tantamount to some sort of an internal schism that could that could break out in violence, which is one of the reasons why you're here. So that that inevitably makes its way into your head as you're like trying to get him to get you more facts, more more information. And then you, you're like, what was the weather like? What was going on in the room? What was going on outside the castle? And just like it was raining missiles. When I looked out side there was these streaks came through the, the clouds and they when they hit the the surrounding area like there was this blinding light of explosions i've never seen anything like it and you realize that the more that he's describing is are not just your like average explosions he's talking about like the type of flashes that will burn out your corneas and blind you if you look at them directly things like stone yeah. burners nukes. which are uh, you know nukes yeah precisely atomic weapons which is deeply suboptimal for this particular situation <laughs> the vividness and the specificity of this furthers my this person is having prophecies um it doesn't give me much to immediately go on other than um would uh, the first person we're going to have to talk to would be Norma about this mm -hmm. to get what the um, Reverend Mother thinks about what we should do with baby's prophecy. So yeah. get Moss uncomfortable, then find Norma and talk to her and relay what I've heard so we can convey as Benny Gesserit what exactly are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> well, he does leave you with one thing because he wasn't able to tell visibly who the people in the room were who killed Daphne, the Duchess, and whoever else just got murdered, whose face he can't uh, pinpoint. But it was an emotion that he felt towards these two, like he knew them. Like yes. he knew the perpetrators that were in the room that were responsible for this crime. Meaning, House Cheshire doesn't have one traitor, they have two. Well, the first now. person to tell would be Norma. <laughs> And Norma actually knows these people, whereas I don't really have any ties. I just work here, so Norma <laughs> will know what to do with the information. Not one tape trader, but two. Also, sure. probably your face dancer is okay, given that he's on the be killed list. Unless, of course, the prophecies being terrible and what they are, that's actually seeing the traitor be executed. But I, I assume, that, yeah. <laughs> I assume that's, Norma that's would know. Oh yeah, most definitely. But you, uh, you get that much from uh, from Mossum, and then it is Pardo's turn. Pardo, you make your way into the war room behind this soldier. I think it's William, though. He's dressed in a uh, soldier's livery, however. But you saw William's face; that was unmistakable. You f follow them in, and uh, you see they don't notice you're there because they're in a hurry. You see and. And they have a weapon in their hand. They have a Mala pistol. Uh, they make their way in and they they access the uh, the um, 
Redulian crystals that are there arranged in the room, and they seem to be uh, cycling through the information that was seen earlier in the evening. It looks like they're trying to destroy the evidence. Stabbing time. <laughs> Stabbing time. Give me a battle roll. <laughs> Taking out a short blade, using power. Going to get the power to control this face dancer. By getting the power to destroy this face dancer. You need three successes for this one. I rolled a one as well. Oh boy. Oh boy. We have two momentum. Is there. Uh, we have three momentum. Against me? Oh. oh! Yes. So you can spend all all three of them and get two extra dice to roll, which means you have if four dice. If the table is okay with it. With me stabbing a traitor? Yeah. Cool. This, this one's important. <laughs> Go for it. Stabby, stab, 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 stab. Stabby, stab, stab, stab. stab. Focus Go a short it. blades. Stab. Oh. Secret messages are one. <laughs> Four successes. Hey, right on the and money. And a 20. Jesus. And die. <laughs> and matches in this game, when it comes to combat, matches go to the attacker, not the defender. Mm -hmm. So, the slow blade succeeds, and you get right past the body shield. Describe how you uh, disembowel the face dancer. Reaction videos. Uh, so in most human bodies, I believe the spleen is on the left side, right between two ribs, at the bottom of the rib cage. That spleen is no longer where it's supposed to be as part of slowly takes the knife and just does <laughs> what we call the jam and jiggle into his rib cage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it, the face dancer doesn't have an opportunity to yell or make any sound of any yeah, sort because you just cool. slide the, the blade expertly in as they turn around to try to defend themselves. Uh, out of nowhere, they have a blade face down, likely poisoned, that's trying to like arc out and try to hit you with it. But you move maneuver in such a way that you just take him out with one shot. You see William's face contort into this... Uh, visage of pain and surprise and you see he just sort of like <coughs> coughs up blood and his, the face starts to change and it just sort of collapses onto the onto the table and like his uh, the blood smears on the controls as he slides off and clatters onto the floor uh, the both of you Norma and Archibald as you're listening you hear there's some sort of commotion that takes place inside I'm assuming you rush right over yeah. Yes. Uh, I would actually, upon seeing this happen, uh, immediately pull out Gam Jabbar and just have it at uh, Pardo's neck while I verify that mm. he is in fact Pardo. Because we've had too many of these things, and the face dancer just died, and I'm not sure if it actually was Gwillian because it was too far away for me to do the normal normal tell. <laughs> yeah, so you both rush in Verified and see Norma. Then trust. Before, yeah, before you could react at what's happening in, in the room with you, Pardo, the door switches open, and then before you could fully turn around, you feel this thing tapping you on the neck, this tiny little pinprick of a of a, this cold steel pressed against your, your neck. And you see Norma leans in and just sort of observes you and says, are you the real Pardo? Yes. Observing <laughs> the evidence. Archibald, you uh, see the, the evidence that was you know, recently brought up on in the war room controls uh, seems to be going through a d auto deletion process, like it was in the process of being destroyed. And here, you, here stands uh, uh, a dead face dancer on the floor, and Pardo with a uh, gum jabbar at his throat. It's still being deleted. I didn't realize it was still <laughs> being deleted. Okay, Pardo we'll reaches over trying our... to turn it off. And that's <sighs> where we'll go on break. We shall return uh... in ten minutes. The time is currently 9.32 uh, uh, Eastern Time. We shall return at 9.42 Eastern Standard Time. We'll be right back. Oh.
and we're back. Sorry for the long wait, everybody. I had a little bit of a goof up on my end here, but we're back and we have returned. And where we left off, it seems that there was a fire that was taking place in the bowels of Castle Cheshire, specifically in the kitchen area. And the klaxon alarms were all going off. Everybody rushed down to see what was going on, but somebody was moving in the opposite direction. Archibald noticed and followed. Pardo noticed and also followed. We came upon a face dancer who was busy trying to destroy the evidence that could absolve Archibald from, you know, his crime, his supposed crime. And uh, Norma uh, also gave chase and ended up in the war room with the face dancer post-mortem after Pardo skewered him with one fell swoop of his uh, blade. And uh, that's when Norma seized upon Pardo and put the Gumja bar right to the Mentat's neck, checking to see if he was indeed who he said he was. And we'll pick right back up where that left off. Uh, the three of you are in the room. How do you respond, Pardo? It's, it's still deleting, Norma. I, ne I need to stop it. If, Prove if yourself, can, then fix it. Can I just go in and stop it myself? Yeah, you can go in and stop it while these two are... I'm going to stop it while okay. these two are having a spit spat. There's I'm going to look at them and I'm going to say, yeah. you guys yes. need a secret word that only you guys know, so that way this doesn't happen every fucking time there is a face dancer <laughs> in the second room. I suggested you, uh, the word guava, but that seems to have fallen to the wayside. <laughs> you you look, you're trying to replay back the tape and see what's what's missing. There's irreparable damage done to it, uh, but it's still wholly intact. It seems that Pardo moves swiftly enough uh, to salvage the majority of the footage, which is precisely what you would have hoped, uh, Archibald, if there was any hope of, of absolving you of your... Uh, supposed crimes, this would have been it. Imagine, since you just can't remember the one detail that would have saved you after that torture, after that interrogation that took place back in the garden months back. Norma will take that moment to create copies off of the server of, of uh... You basically, yeah, you basically have know. to take the crystal out, put it in a specific machine, and then put another, like, blank crystal into, into its nexus to basically copy the information straight over. It's never 100%, you know, exact, but it's a copy is better than not having a backup at this point. Yeah. They immediately get to work on, on trying to make that copy. Uh, so that leaves you, Archibald, and Pardo in the room now that the situation is somewhat diffused. You have a dead face dancer face down on the floor. See, what Pardo is going to do is reach down and slap the, the face dancer's corpse. Because the removal of a spleen is not usually that fatal. It's not a usual like instant death. So he's just making sure you're dead, right? You're dead. Yeah, slap, slap. You, <laughs> slap. somewhere in there, like, your blade must have nicked something because it, it hit him hmm. uh, just enough that it would, it basically took him out. He's a no-name move guy, so you yeah. know, it took him out one shot. Mechanically, going... it was an easy death, but just wow, that was that was swift. <laughs> I'm going to observe him. I also want to search his pockets for any clues. Um, basically, give him the rundown before the uh, castle guard gets to him and stuff is hidden. You check his pockets and stuff. He check, you know, and it, sure enough, it is a legitimate, you know, House Cheshire. Uh, soldier outfit that he's wearing you're kind of wondering how long uh this face dancer's been masquerading around in this out uniform as a matter of now that you think about it you're like how long has this asshole been here why did he move now um you get reports from the upstairs lysander um and uh they gwilliam gets the same there's some been some activity on the other wing of the house, like uh, where the war room is located, it seems that there's some people there in the archives room. There was some sort of an there was some sort of an intruder there that they detected, but the situation's handled. Our uh, 
Are Lysander and Daphne outside of the kitchen and alone now? Uh, yes, I'm assuming, you know, yes, because I believe uh, Rachel said that Daphne was moving back towards where her, her mother's chambers while these were these two were uh, tussling in the uh, the war room. So, yeah, you're probably on your way there and you can talk to one another if you wish. My lady. Are we sure that William is Quillian, at least the one that we saw in the kitchen. We are not, but that is one of his favorite tactics. That whole scene, it was a feint. I can believe it. It also seems a uh, dramatic overkill to burn the body that badly. That really, it's quite good well. with a needle gun. He doesn't need to resort to fireballs. I figure he was in the kitchen, so like there was a tussle and the poor guy ended up in the fryer or something like that, caught fire and just crispified. <laughs> Why was the doctor in the kitchen? That's the only part I'm confused about. If he was attacking the doctor, why was the doctor in the kitchen? I assumed he just wanted a snack. <laughs> Does one normally go to the kitchen yourself when you want a snack when you have a house full of servants? Well, he wasn't at the dinner. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, based on my watching of, like, overdone British dramas, like, the servants eat in or near the kitchen. They don't get to eat in the really nice dining room. Correct. And for all intents and purposes, the doctor, Dr. Sloan, is a captive? Not really sure what, what uh, cubbyhole to put him in exactly. He's defecting, but... He's there an hasn't been honored any guest. <laughs> I was kind of curious. Now, it's perfectly possible he's just a snoopy kind of person who likes to bother the servants, but if he's a captive slash guest, again, he'd probably be getting stuff brought to him. And he's a suck doctor. He's not just a hireling. So they, um, and he still probably wouldn't be anywhere near a deep fryer. Given the scale of the castle, they have to have some sort of common area to eat in. So that's the point that's confusing for me. Although it's the easiest answer is he was talking to someone in the kitchen because he's a friendly fellow and he'd like to get along with the people he's defecting to. Mm -hmm. Possibility and sometimes well. people have human motives. All things to think about. Um, you get to... Okay. Lysander. What if the doctor was speaking to someone who was collaborating with, accused them of attacking him. It would because certainly Because someone be... stumbled upon the scene. It would certainly be a way to further win our trust if we think that House Carol is determined to murder him. And it could be a possibility that he is faking defecting to be able to come here and speak with someone who he's supposed to coordinate with. It's possible. He has given us good intelligence, but nothing that would dramatically hurt House Carol. Just promise me that if you decide to sneak off in the night, send for me first. I will. And I promise I'll only sneak off if I think that doing that is what the house needs. But 
I agree with you. I don't like the situation at all. The dagger was too conveniently placed. Someone wants... Someone wants... to start a war between us and House Carol. And I don't think it's House Carol. You, uh, he does, that's one of the last things she says before and she walks through the doors and you see uh, Adeline is, is sitting up in the suspensor chair. What's going on? What's happening out there? They're telling uh, me there's a body? There is. Uh, someone uh, ostensibly came after the doctor, trying to kill him for being a defector. Uh, Gwilian took care of it, but there's a lot of suspicious elements and Daphne will talk about like the knife it's kind of weird that he was like burned beyond all recognition because that seems like overkill um, and repeat her conclusion that someone is trying to get Cheshire and House Carol to go to war against each other she points out that House Cheshire and House Carol have technically been at war for decades now uh but it's there's been there actually has been a pretty long lull uh in hostilities against from one house to the other so this yeah like recent it's, activity yeah it's been a cold war that someone wants to turn hot exactly yeah i see where you're getting that. Just like, where is is masam okay is he is he safe Oh, he's in very good hands with his Bene Gesserit uh, caretaker, but I'll I'll check on him next. Please, send them my way. I want to make sure that they're they're safe. Of course, I'll start heading over to where Mossum is, and right. Lysander will accompany. <laughs> All right, Thea, you are joined by uh, the Duchess's daughter Daphne and her body. Mossum is now much calmer. Uh, you see, he's just sort of like the Klaxon's alarm alarms have all gone off now, and they're working on trying to get the smoke uh, out of the air. Uh, you hear like the units working in the background, but other than that, it's pretty quiet. Uh, Belanda is just sort of standing by the doorway, leaning in, just checking on on Mossum, observing him. Uh, he finally works up the courage, and he's like, oh, "I'll be fine. Thank you." Like he's kind of like. Goes back, lays back down, but you know he's not sleeping anytime soon. Even though he's pretending very, uh, uh, very ardently to make it appear as if he's asleep. I give Belonda a task then. As the other person there, her job is to use her Benny Gesserit wiles to further calm him down and get him to sleep. <laughs> Without be offending him or otherwise getting to, because that's an appropriate thing for a Benny Gesserit to do. He's like, so he considers, he's like, I can, I can be boring. And she nods and like, she just saunters into the room. Hey, Massim. <laughs> Proceed. As you're leaving the room, you Volume see Volume 8. Volume 8. <laughs> Parts and regulations of ornithopter construction. Oh my god. <laughs> Sleep went to a coma. <laughs> all right, so convey all the information that I got with my scene to Norma, so she has the same thing. Um, mentioned my suspicion that that sounds like the possibility of two traitors, regardless, either two traitors being punished or two traitors up to no good. Oh, do you also mention this to Lysander and Daphne? I leave it up to Norma to convey that information because Norma knows these people and knows the immediate response will be them to say stab William and Pardo. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, you all meet up roughly around that same area, um, and you see, you know, Thea moving out to to go get uh, Norma. Norma, I'm assuming, is leaving the war room at this point with the what she has. Yeah. And uh, yes. For the record, Pardo is pretty low on the list of potential traitors right now. That's what he wants you to think. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, but there's a bunch of people who have been acting way more squirrely than him. That's why he sticks out. 
also the fact that he was missing and he doesn't know or won't doesn't know slash won't say where he was for the unknown amount of time that he was not himself oh no that's that's totally suspicious but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's a traitor but uh Melis is it, super it fucking squirrely his, Melis it, it means is that his entire brain might have already been copied because we know about these machines so Melis okay, that doesn't mm. make him a traitor though no 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 but it does mean he's a liability from yes. everything he knew before Liability, I'll agree with, but no, my my biggest suspicion right now is on Omelis. Hmm, the advisors, of course. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's like it. so. I'm not gonna tell anyone that yet, though. Okay, so the three of you emerge from uh, the war room to see. The, uh, the Duchess's daughter, Lysander, and Thea approaching. Thea just sort of whispers to Norma something about what happened earlier. Norma, it's up to you. You feel like this information, despite it being very important to the system, it might be something that the Duchess needs to know about. As it oh, yes, pertains no. to Masam, who is, you know, blood, uh, blood relations. No, the, the Duchess would find out about it. I would just also have to, because now... Norma is suspicious of everyone. Uh, verify that they are not face dancers before I give relevant information. Now Norma yeah. is actively going to be searching out every single person of suspicion and checking them to see if they are, in fact, who they are. But first, yeah. Norma is going to inform them that... Uh, when we went to the war room to check on this information, we failed to save the information, and that is exactly what I'm going to tell everyone. We failed to recover the information. It was lost. The face dancer that was disguised as Gwilyon entered the room prior to Pardo, myself, and Archibald and started the deletion process. Pardo skillfully took him out, but all the information regarding Archibald's uh, doctor incident, gone. I will inform some certain people in this group later on, but until the information is disseminated, that is currently what everyone will know. The, right, uh, so you explain that to everybody as they come up, like, hey, mm -hmm. this is what happened. And uh, as for what Thea tells me, I will inform the Duchess, like I said, after verifying. Because now, Norma's now paranoid for face dancers that aren't really, and even those that are. Because Norma told William. And there you have it. So they explained this to, to you in, in such terms uh, when you approached, you know, like, hey, there was an intruder, Pardo got him, it's under control, but this is what it, this is what the consequences of this was. This feint, or whatever you want to call it, was successful, at least in so uh, to destroy any evidence that would absolve General Archibald of his crimes. Which begs the question then, what exact, what kind of game is it exactly that uh, House Carol is playing? Uh, what do you, with, with that out of the way, um, you all see that, you know, this has been quite an exciting evening, that's to say the least, and you feel pretty exhausted. Uh, unless you have anything specific that you want to do, uh, you know, the house security is taking care of everything. You see, uh, Gwilion is leading his uh, his share of the, the troops to basically, you know, uh, scan, the, you know, uh, move out through the hallways and clear out anything that might be uh, considered a, an obstruction or a bomb or something like that that they may have left behind. So uh, they implore, the, the troops implore all of you to return back to your quarters and remain until the next morning, after which they would have already conducted a sweep of the, of the castle and cleared it with the uh, head of security. That being Lysander, of course. Hi. 
would like to ask William a quick question. Sure. <laughs> William, do you, are you capable of recreating artificial markings, tattoos? If it's part of the, uh, who I'm copying, yes, of course. Very well, then. Uh, Norma will speak to Gwilion about an event occurring in the past that they were both privy to and intentionally muck up some details to see that uh, as if he would agree with them or if he will correct me. Uh, one, one last thing I wanted to add. Uh, Gwilion says that the inf what the face dancer is able to do depends solely on their intelligence. So if, say, they only see the face of a person and not the, you know, the markings that they have on their body and they try to take their shape, they won't inherently get the information that they don't know, right? So like if you're, if you ha if you're completely tatted up from like your neck down and you're completely covered up 99% of the time, they're not going to know about those markings. In case that's one way that you can reveal a traitor, in this case, the face dancer, because they, they're not—they don't have what the you know they're, they're supposed to have. Strip search. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, on that note, thanks for the raid, Onyx Path. Hey, what's up? Hey! Welcome to the madness. <laughs> uh, so you have that information to go on. You were saying something, Norma, that you wanted to to do as far as like a. Backup plan? I'm verifying Gwillian is Gwillian, like that this uh... Gwillian is Gwillian, by basically doing a, you know, what is something that he would know that I would be lying about while talking to him so that he can then correct me and be like, yeah, okay. This is undoubtedly Gwillian, the okay. genuine article. I will then give him a quick summary of the face dancer that uh, entered and state that uh, he needs to gather up all of his personal face dancers because I'm going to conduct a search of uh, certain persons in this uh, our captivity to verify that he, they are them. He gives you a hard look when you say that. And he's like, my face dancers are not compromised, Reverend Mother. I'm not implying that. I am just that making is what sure implying. that they don't get in my way of finding what might be another. I'm sure they've given you a wide berth. You don't have to worry about my people. Just stay out of my way, he says. You'll get your wish tomorrow, he says, and turns on his heel and leaves. He's basically saying, like, I'll send you my face dancers tomorrow as you requested. Oh, no, no, I'm not asking for them. I'm saying I want him to make sure that they're out of the way while I'm conducting the search. Oh, oh I, yeah, I thought no, you wanted I'm, them I'm not, to, I'm like, not insulting, single I'm not file, insulting him like, in telling, your office. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm telling him, pull back so that I can do this without having extraneous face dancers that might lead to a false positive. Well, my face dancers no more than than to get in anybody's way. Their job is to blend into the background, disappear, come when I come whistling. They ask when they show up. They know better than to get in your way or anybody else's for that matter. Good. And with that, right. it turns into leaves. Yeah, uh, I'm fine with that. <laughs> All right. I think everybody, uh, well, one thing that you do get from other memory when Thea tells you about Masum and the, the visions that he's having. You immediately, your thoughts immediately turn to the the breeding program and the, the Kwisatz Haderach and start getting whispers, not from the navigator that you that saved your life uh, during the agony, but from the other voices, the menagerie that it sort of hangs at the periphery of your of your mind and like the the deepest darkest shadows of your uh, consciousness. The whispers come to you and they're like, Where's that Tadarak? We've killed so many of them. And you realize these are the voices of other Bene Gesserit Reverend Mothers who came before you. And they're alleging that there have been many Kwisatz Haderachs and that they've had to put them down. 
with that, we'll fast forward to the next morning. The morning bell rings and it's time for breakfast. Everybody's invited down to the main banquet hall to take part. Uh, there's no more, there's just the faintest uh, lingering uh, scent of uh, smoke in the air. Uh, now it's replaced with like bacon, and eggs, and uh, gravy, and foie gras, whatever, like all the fancy breakfast stuff that you would expect at a place like this. Some sweet and pundy rice from Caladan, uh, you know, uh, uh, fresh milk and such. So you have your, your pick of the litter as far as like breakfast items and such. But the Duchess expresses expediency. She tells everyone that a security meeting is, uh, is first thing on the docket, so to speak. So as soon as breakfast is concluded, everyone is to meet in the situation room with her, Elmelas, and you know, the rest of the entourage. And this time, given that she's already received reports from Norma and, and such, or as what happened earlier in the evening last night, she also wants Thea to attend the security briefing as well. And off Sans I get. the children, of course. I will <laughs> also, I will check in on the children before I go to see if Belanda managed to get to volume eight before Mostyn went unconscious. <laughs> yeah. Um, am I allowed to go to the security briefing? Yeah, um, no. Not this part. Not this one. So instead, you are sent uh, servants that cater to you uh, at the dinner table and whatnot at the banquet hall. Whatever you need, they can uh, they can fetch for you, but ultimately they are locking you out of the uh, security meeting, as it were. Okay. Um, right, one second. I'm getting a lot of secret messages. I apologize. <laughs> Coming soon, Devin. Um, so, skipping past the breakfast, um, you arrive at the situation room. You see Omelis is there uh, with his typical gaze as you enter. Quite a lapse in security, a colossal lapse in security. He says, "Really sloppy." He says, "As as uh, Gwilian is is walking into the room, and William, you know, Gwilian and him have gotten into it many, many times over the years. This sort of silent passive passive aggressiveness, and they, he just kind of gives him a look and saunt you sauntering off into the room. Uh, Adeline just shoots him a look, like you know, rein it in, Omelas." So finally, everyone's gathered and you sit down around the very large table. Uh, and that's when uh, the Duchess basically asks for a full situation report on what happened and how how things are, are going to progress now that you know everything that there is to know about uh, the general and, uh, you know, the many important things that are house items that need to be addressed, such as the failed supposed assassination attempt on the, the Sook Dr. Sloan, who is also not present for the security meeting, of course. It's like, I need answers. It's like if House Carol is playing games and wants to eliminate their traitor, and he has information that could be of use to us, then we should probably put that information to use immediately. Like a, we have a slew of messages and things that we have to address. I suppose we should probably address the, the glaring lapses in security. And she looks at uh, Homelis, uh, who would like to begin. And she looks to Lysander. She looks to the Marshal, uh, Master Reed, as you two are the, and Will, Willian, of course, as you are the sort of heads of security with the Pardo leading, the, being the Marshal and uh, Lysander having his own contingent of troops to, to command. I, too, would like to know how this assassin got so far past our defenses to reach our kitchen. If they had wanted to do something else, they could have wreaked mass havoc on this house. If I may, your highness, you see Gwilion says. And she, he go, approaches the table, and you know, Adeline nods. He approaches the table, and William throws down a, uh, a hollow image of a dead man, like on the floor, like this, like uh, blood, you know, seeping onto the, onto the floor. 
Looks old. Looks like an old corpse. Like dried blood everywhere. We found him this morning when we searched the, the quarters of the of the dead soldier whose uh, livery the face answer was wearing. This traitor, this uh, sleeper agent was here for quite some time. Judging by the body, doc, Dr. Sloan confirmed it was probably weeks, largely a month, at least a month's time. And you see O'Malley says like, do we trust the doctor's assessment, however? I suspect that this was a contact for the doctor. I don't think the doctor is trustworthy at all. And so he killed him? You see O'Malley challenges you on that, Lysander. I think they were having a meeting. I think they were discovered. And I think that the doctor cried wolf. Willing to sacrifice his contact instead of himself. Who killed the contact then, might I ask? I did. So doctors see, are William conditioned says... not to kill. You did. Hmm. Or at least I fired the killing shot. The doctor and uh, the assailant were tussling around in the kitchen before I arrived. Was the Sook doctor harming his assailant? Unclear. It's like uh, there was a lot of movement, a lot of noise. It was dark, but I saw the doctor. He was being attacked. I fired the shot into the back of his assailant. It's like a he fell forward, head first into the ovens, went up like a candle. Then I'm assuming he was covered in an accelerant of some sort. Something to cause him to ignite in an oven. I'm not a uh, forensics expert, Master Reed. Perhaps you are. Do we have the body? Do we have pictures of the body? For me we to do. Examine? Currently in the medical wing under the supervision of Dr. Sloan. Hmm. You said they were tussling when you shot. Can Correct. you guarantee that it is not, as we have experienced, the face dancer that might have taken his form and thrown him, the doctor, into fires to cover up the fire was too extensive to tell whether or not the assailant was a face dancer or not exactly but if this was a coordinated effort and house carol is responsible then that means house carol has their own face dancer or maybe perhaps more well here is my question who benefits the most if House Cheshire and House Carol start actively fighting each other again. You see, Adeline says that. That sounds like a Mentec question. Look to Pardo. <laughs> Just to remind Key, there are three houses on Jabberwock? Are Four. there not? Oh, sorry. You don't, no, you're right. You're right. There are three. There's House Drunenbar, <laughs> which is the major house. There is House of Cardes and House Cheshire. House Carol's in a separate system. They're on uh, Nyush, is the name of the, the planet. Right next to Gruman and Gamont. Uh, Gruman being the uh, homeworld of House Moritani. So they're ways away from you. But the one thing that you and House Carol have in common is that you're in the same industry together in crafting ornithopters. And so is House of Cardis. Perhaps Sick. a newcomer to this situation, but in the video that was attempting to be deleted, would it not actually stabilize the current balance of power if it were deleted? It would. And that's all Pardo is going to say on that matter. <laughs> His lips are sealed on anything else about that. And a civil war would be 
deeply detrimental to the overall survival of House Carol. I can tell that the person that is of the family, but currently not in a good relationship with the other members, has considerable influence himself. And while it's perhaps too convoluted that he conducted it, or supporters of him, situations like this may also arise from allies, particularly those who benefit from the current order maintaining as it does. You see Omela's response to this, why is she here? And why is she insinuating that we have traitors in our midst? What would you do? That should be taken for granted. Omelas, may I ask you a question? Of course. Why... Were you thinking of the current state of being of our house? Current power structure of our house? Were you thinking of this, Omelas? Young master, I've been thinking of the, of the status of this house for generations. I was thinking about the status of this house before you were born. What mm. is your question? That was my question, if you were thinking of it. <laughs> and she is here because she is taking care of Masum whose destiny, for better or worse, is bound up in this house's destiny. This is your religious gobbledygook, you see, uh, Omela says, and you see, uh, Golin looks over at him and is like, no, it is not. And that's when Omela uh, kind of, you know, takes a turn and looks at Gwilian seriously and is like, can you honestly tell me you know anything about what they're talking about, face dancer? And he's like, perhaps the the Duchess hasn't uh, informed you, Omelas, of why I decided to defect from the Tailaxu and serve House Cheshire. The reason I know that Masum's visions are real and that his prescience is something to be protected, perhaps even utilized, is because I had those visions as well. I've seen my place in this universe and it is at the behest of House Cheshire. It is why I serve her grace. You see, Omelas is just kind of like, she never told me that. She, she could give us this look like, I didn't know that. <laughs> I'd smile like the aforementioned Cheshire Cat, having done my part of making pe people say their feelings publicly. <laughs> yeah, you're picking up on a lot of bad blood between this Mentat and the, and the uh, spy master for House uh, Cheshire, a face dancer. So. Uh, they don't so... like Daphne is going to say something, and as soon as she says it, her focus is going to be on uh, specifically Omelas and Archibald um, and Pardo's reaction. I'm not in the room, by the right, way. Right, you're not in the room. Um, but yeah, she's going to try to like stay aware of how people react when uh, to Amelis, she says, I wasn't getting mystical. I was suggesting that it would be a good idea for me to cultivate a positive relationship with my brother. Hmm. You're, you mean your uncle? <laughs> talking about Archibald? No. Oh, you're talking about uh, Mossum. Yeah, because I, I just said, oh. like, our, our house's destinies are intertwined. Uh, mm -hmm. They got all mystical, which Daphne was not expecting, and so she's going to suggest like I just tease my brother we should cultivate a good relationship that's good for the house and just sort of see if mm -hmm. that information seems to affect anyone seems to be new yeah Adeline agrees and yeah you know, Omelis is somewhat cowed <laughs> uh, at his earlier outburst of course my lady forgive my uh, my doubt okay uh, but no, no one seems surprised to hear that <laughs> That's what she's checking for. Uh, well, 
to Omelas, he's he doesn't know anything about Masum, or or at mm -hmm. least in in this terms, he doesn't know anything about that. So when when uh, when Thea and and uh, Gwilliam started bringing up these dreams, these visions, that's when he was kind of like, "What? What are you talking about?" Uh, and I think the majority of everybody else is pretty surprised, uh, with the exception perhaps of uh, Lysander, who I think was there when Masum first started seeing his mother dying in his visions and stuff like that, dying in different. Uh, environments and in different manners and stuff. Almost like yeah. he's fated to die. Yeah, yeah, Lysander was there for a lot of the stuff between Lady Daphne and Masum, I believe. Yeah, I'm I'm essentially looking for someone who should know but doesn't. <laughs> One second. I have to make a roll. <laughs> Excellent, that was the right decision. <laughs> I don't know if it'll work, but it was the right decision. Just answering a just answering message, don't mind me. Uh, <laughs> could you repeat the last thing you said, Rachel? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Daphne will say, I, I didn't mean for this conversation to turn mystical, but are you suggesting that I shouldn't cultivate a positive relationship with my brother? Not at all, of course. Of course not. You see, Omelas defends himself to the best of his ability. Uh, you see the Duchess is like, all right, enough in 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 enough navel-gazing at this point. We, you know, Masum is family, and we will treat him as such. We will protect him at, a, at, at any cost. And it's like, a, on to the is situation at hand. We have a, we have a, uh, a situation right now that's about to explode on, on Snicker. We also have issues that, that need, that, um, require our attention. We are on a clock now. We've received messages from Chom Company. You remember Chom Company, of course. We have a contract for them on Arrakis, given to us by the Emperor. Kaitane is dispatching a Imperial adjudicator? I don't know if that's the correct word. Or adjuster or auditor, perhaps? Him and his team, they and, the, and their team will be a arriving here shortly and we need someone to well divert their attention to put it bluntly because as of right now they are supposed to be looking at all of our finances including our manufacturing uh, status on the moon of snicker if they see the current mess that we're in this could cause problems for us back on kiting with the emperor and, you know, Davos is there, so she looks to Davos. Davos, you are the house treasurer. And he's like, you get his feet up on his ta on the table and he's like, yes, ma'am. Yeah, you yes, your grace. <laughs> he corrects himself and he's like, why don't you take the uh, auditor and his team on a little flight around Jabberwock? Keep them occupied. We need, to, we need you to buy us time. Time to figure out how we're going to address this issue with General Archibald and the insurgents on the moon. Shit. Oh, I gotta make another roll. <laughs> okay. Uh, second. Lysander, you get a, a, a little call while this is happening from one of your troops that are outside. One of the guards, like, <sighs> General's been eavesdropping, caught him in the, uh, in the gratings just that that <laughs> lead to the situation room he's been eavesdropping on your little meeting what do you want me to do with him bring him to the door <laughs> archibald you uh you're listening to everything that's going on it's kind of echoing you know this castle like the back of your hand you grew up here this is your home so there's there are ways around, you know, this sort of thing being locked out of your own house. So you've you've listened to everything that's been happening so far, and then somebody puts a hand on your shoulder, and just kind of like, uh, uh <laughs> does that number? And uh, there's a group of guards there. They're like, come with us, please, and start escorting you over to the uh, situation room. You see, Adeline is like, is something wrong with Sandra? seems that the general 
has heard everything that has gone on in the war room. This see, Omelis speaks, like, gets this little jab in there. You see, he can't be trusted. We I have, have to... a test first. Hold on. We must make sure it is really Archibald who has been eavesdropping before we even begin. You suspect some sort of an, another doppelganger? Another face dancer? One can never be sure. There are always sure. more face dancers, yes. Exactly. We are plagued with face dancers. Situation. Ever since this one arrived here, you see Omelis like points at William and at uh, <laughs> Adeline is like, Omelis, please. And he kind of composes, recomposes himself as best as he can. Door opens, Archibald is let in. He's in his full, you know, general attire. Archibald, what is my favorite fruit? <laughs> I don't know, you've never told me. I think that's the test. <laughs> you've never thing you never thought I've discussed fruit with you before? On a previous day? Or a night of some sort? Archibald? Omelas is like, this is ridiculous. And it's like, I can prove he is who he says he is. Uh, here. And he kind of like, he, he asks you something like, where does, uh, where did Federico have a mole uh, or like a weird birthmark? Like, where was it exactly on his body that he had? You would know you grew up with him, your kids. Where Where is his most telling, you know, mark? I would tell him where it was. I don't know as the player. <laughs> oh, I mean, you can make it up. Oh. It's left butt cheek. <laughs> the mole got a third on his nipple. left arm. It was actually b below a scar he got. From an accident. By, a thr by another thropter. You remember the accident. Huh. Yep. <coughs> he, he looks and it's like... He looks a little more thoughtful now, and he's like, this, ladies and gentlemen, this is General Archibald Cheshire. The no face dancer just, can fake that. Pardo leans on his hand, just sh shakes his head, and just mutters under his breath, Wava. No <laughs> he wasn't there when you said Guava, the other two were. He really was. wasn't. I don't remember no, because that conversation. When, when we were in the it war was in the room, war room night, the he night said, before. I told you we should come up with a code word. That's true. And he said Guava. <laughs> I forgot. Uh. Player. <laughs> <laughs> no See, I heard Llama. Yeah. That's even better. Llama is my favorite fruit. <laughs> you see um, uh, Adeline looks at Omelas and uh, the rest of you and is like well since you already know what it is that's going on here perhaps you can uh, give us your perspective general shut the doors and she instructs the other soldiers to close the doors uh, you see Davos like I'm gonna go and uh, deal with that adjuster you know, I'll, uh, I'll see you all later he says he gets up and he stomps out of the room um and she, uh, Adeline looks to... Oh, sorry, go ahead. That's Omelis is leaving? No, no, no uh, Davos. Davos is leaving to take care of the adjuster because him and his team are arriving soon. So he's like, I'm going to go meet him out there and I'm going to, you know, give him the run around so he doesn't look okay, too I, closely into what we're doing. I thought it was Omelis who was leaving and I was about to eye talk to oh, Lysander, no. have him followed. Uh, but no, <laughs> Davos is cool. Yeah. Uh, you see, I after he leaves... Uh, that's two, two down for Omelis. All right. Uh, the doors close, and you see the Adeline looks to Omelas, and, and she, she's like, "Now, before we move on to the more serious business, let's get on with, you know, the trivial nonsense that we have to deal with as a as a house miner." You see, Omelas is like, "Oh yes, uh, the Archduke uh, Armandi Kaz is getting married before the end of next year." Like we are all invited to take part in the celebration. Um, Lysander, remember how you failed your previous house? You failed to protect them. That's how you got that scar across your face. 
when he says house he cause all the hairs on your neck stand up you haven't heard that name in a very very long time the archduke of course is is the famous one-armed uh, archduke of the cause and this is a planet which is you know rife with all sorts of different plants and trees that are uh, harvested and distributed throughout the Imperium. It's actually, he, he's part of a major house. And they're reaching out to you to invite uh, everybody within the entourage to his wedding, to Lady uh, Francesca, as she's called. Uh, some merchant, some rich merchant's daughter. And uh, you see Adeline uh, makes a point to uh, to look at you, uh, Daphne, when she's, when Omelis is reading out this, the, the invitation, the official invitation, you know? Uh, and she she talks she she does uh, nonverbal communication with her eyes, and she's basically saying you know like you should probably go and maybe take Lysander or someone with you. Uh, we have to seriously start considering a suitor at some point. After all, she says. <laughs> How does she respond, if at all? Uh, yeah, she responds with, "Oh, goody, a party." <laughs> uh, basically, there's no timeline on this. Whenever or if you decide to go, that's when it happens. But that's essentially it. Uh, she seems to be somewhat intrigued by this because they are a great house. They have ties to other great houses. Uh, Omelas, go, you know, his eyes go up and he, he searches his memory. He's like, yes, Hasi Kaz, famous allies to House Atreides. This could be a useful alliance if we were to ingratiate ourselves in, in their presence. Would you not agree, Your, your Grace? And you see Adeline nods. Like, yes, I do agree. This would, be a good, this would be something worth pursuing, just not something we need to think about as of right now. Perhaps later. And he's like, what else do we have? Uh, let's see. We have to talk about the video, of course, and the general's innocence or lack thereof. We are, of course, going to need your assistance with the situation on Snicker. This is why you're here, after all. As we are working to uncover House Carol's machinations, we do have to pay attention to the more immediate problem. And that is a problem that is far reaching into the future, for our future lies on Arrakis now, on the Trom Company contract that the Emperor has signed us. We need to turn the situation around immediately. We figure you are the only person that these insurgents may be listening to, or may be willing to adhere to. Uh, these white rabbits, as they call themselves, have taken control of the manufacturing apparatus on the moon. I, I imagine there are various ways to tackle this particular problem. And you see, but the reason, there is a reason why I recommended the general here. And if you may, if I may, you see, he looks to Adeline and she, she says, take it away, of course. And Omelis proceeds to give a presentation of sorts. Uh, un unless Jared would like to regale the entourage with the general's previous exploits as to why he's uh, being considered for this particular uh, assignment to deal with the right rabbits. Can you repeat that again? So basically, Omelis is being uh, asked to uh, provide why, or he's offering why he chose the general as the uh, the person to best deal to you, your character to deal with the situation on the moon. And if you remember, the a lot of the the insurgents that are armed and military trained by House Cheshire on the moon were trained underneath you and your brother. And uh, there is one other time in House Cheshire's history that there was this sort of disruption on that moon by these same insurgents or the, you know, the parents of these insurgents oh. back then. Yes. And there I was would. one time that it was resolved without any violence, without a single shot being fired by either side. Would you like to tell them that story or would you like Omelis to uh, Correct, them? yeah, I could. Omelis, I'll tell them the story. And now I'll tell them how we're going to do it. And it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Mm. Gets up, dusts it off, dusts himself off. And as regal as she as he could. 
Basically, whether you like to believe it or not, a past foreman of the moon. This hap this happened before. The foreman didn't treat. Obviously didn't treat the workers right. Was doing everything bad to them. They could. So there was insurrections popping up on the moon. And before you know it, the, the planet was, the moon was locked down, just like how it was today. My brother sent me in my vanguard with soldiers as well to go and deal with this insurrection. But the thing is, I'm not in to killing my own people. That's the last thing I'll ever do. And I'm sure that my soldiers didn't want to kill their parents, their loved ones, and the same for the residents on the moon. So what I did was I had them take me hostage. Having them take me hostage when I when they took me, they didn't exactly know what to do with me. All right. It will give some leeway into negotiating terms. What I'm curious what Lysander thinks of that. How uh, this general basically got up and says, yeah, the last time I had to deal with this sort of situation, I was forced to make a decision. Do I crush the rebellion and kill, you know, my my kin, my my uh, my own people and force my soldiers to shoot their brothers and their fathers? Or do I not do that? Uh, and so since he couldn't bring he says that he instead of bringing himself to give those orders, he instead surrendered himself to the enemy and put himself at their mercy to see what they would actually do. And this purportedly brought them to the negotiating table. And eventually, he, he was returned to House Cheshire unharmed, not a hair out of place, and the situation was diffused. How does Lysander feel when he sees this general get up and tell that story? I'm curious. Uh, he definitely questions it because, I don't know, it seems a bit too set up. Um, yeah, that's, fact, that's basically your king chess piece, like, and you're just handing it over? Mm-hmm. He also views it as very diplomatic because of not wanting to instigate war between loved ones. And also very foolish if he wasn't, if this wasn't rigged because mm -hmm. he could have died and the war could have just escalated from there so many conflicting thoughts oh yeah <laughs> excellent pardo what do you make of the general story it's one master chess player looking at another master chess player they're in good hands and Later, Chiap's game will be magnificent. <laughs> Ongoing, yes. <laughs> um, so with that, Omelas kind of rests his case, so to speak, after the general gives his story. And he's like, this is why I thought perhaps we could use the general to great effect. These are the sons and daughters of the previous rebellions, the previous insurgents on the moon. Such a gesture, perhaps even just seeing him, might be beneficial in diffusing this whole situation. 
and bringing them to the table since they won't meet with any of us, he says. General? Yes. Would you be willing to help us in quelling this rebellion? Yes, I would. Excellent. And we must discuss the forms, he says. And he that's when he pulls out like these uh, these very formal looking like crystalline papers that are rolled out on the table. And obviously you have to detail the the entourage would have to detail them, the Duchess and uh, everybody would have to agree to some extent on what sort of power to hand the general because, and this is something that he, he will point out, um, if you are going to instill some kind of power in our general, in, in Archibald, either as a retainer of the house or as an officially recognized noble within the house, that will reverberate beyond House Cheshire. It will it will impact what happens with the local Sisselrad, the local houses of this system when they meet together in council. It will also affect the, the other major federated houses of the Lansrad, you know? Because what happens when General Archibald or Archibald Cheshire shows up on their doorstep, how do they treat this person? Well, if they're of nobility, they have a certain uh, modicum or expectation of behavior. Uh, of how to treat him. Uh, so this is all pertinent information that has to be set in concrete now, moving forward to, to deal with the situation that is uh, uh, pending it on, on the moon. So uh, Adeline poses the question to all of you. And it's like, if we are to instill Archibald, but some modicum of power how far should this go exactly obviously Archibald has no say in this we hold the cards here but we obviously need his assistance we have to come to some sort of a an agreement an accord my thought is that we accept him as a member of the house. But we have to be careful about how we do that. I don't know, uncle, what you're guilty of. I do know that in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of the Landsrad, you are guilty of fratricide. And for the good of the house, we cannot be seen to simply forgive crimes of that nature because it's convenient. How do you respond, General? I completely understand why you would put the you would put our territory in a complete disarray of civil war. You'd have your believers and your non-believers. So I understand that reason why. Until my name is cleared, I will not. I will most likely not get the good faith of the people, well, not, at least not all of them. And I know that. Anyone else? I find that I agree with Lady Daphne. Amelis poses the question, and so he is to be a retainer of the house. He is uh, to be an agent or force of the house, not fully recognized for his bloodline, for his uh, hereditary features, or his, uh, you know, uh, what am I trying to say here? Not for his nobility. I will recognize him as my uncle, because some things in this world cannot be changed, and blood is one of them. And I will also express my gratitude 
at being related to such a devoted servant of the house. That's a lot of trust you're being instilled with, uh, Archie, Archibald, from your, uh, your blood here. Uh, Omelas is like, now what of the title to instill onto the former general or no title at all? So within the setting, this is a question for the storyteller. What would our options be? I mean, you could just say that he's uh, an agent, basically somebody who works for the house, in which case he has no standing higher than like the any soldier or servant. He's a servant of the house, is what that would ultimately mean. And he has, he's basically like, in terms of like the hierarchy, it's Regis Familia. <laughs> uh, the masters of the house like Pardo, uh, Lysander, um, Norma, the consort, who's head of household. And then it's like the generals and the soldiers and servants. And somewhere along that lower rung around soldier and servants is where Archibald would be. He's basically just like somebody who carries out a task. Member. So, right, so any one of you could legally say, do this, or you'll be reprimanded for it, etc. So a general would be placed below the war master, is what I'm hearing. Yes, because yeah. if he were to be instilled, and this is something you know, Pardo, if he was instilled uh, the title of general, he would take the role of war master away from you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You would still retain the title of marshal, of course. I mean, it gives you authority over the secret police, the looking glass, as you called it, but not the armed forces, not the soldiers and, you know, and so on. Not the standing army of your battalions. Hmm. So, I kind of want to give him a title, something like Consul or Herald, something that hmm. implies that he speaks with the authority of the house. Okay. But doesn't That's necessarily really wield that authority on his own behalf. Uh, okay. All right. And yet, uh, Omelas, you know, kind of, uh, uh, he kind of, uh, he, he says something prior to as before you start putting pen to paper he kind of like you know uh we have to be we have to think about this carefully because if we give him any kind of uh standing power that also makes him a target of our enemies meaning he could be captured and held hostage he could be targeted for assassination and so on well for them to see them try That was one good thing about me. I'm really hard to kill. He gives you this look like they really did try to kill somebody in this castle last night. Are you sure you want to be so flippant about it? He just he communicates all of that with just a look to you, like really, really, dog. Right. Um, but that's that's basically he. That's how he lays it out. So, uh, you. Adeline and Omelas and everybody, they kind of pass the paper around. Everybody sees it and he kind of okays it. And they, she signs off on it once everybody's okay with what the rules are regarding his standing within the house. Uh, Ar Archibald, of course, has no say, but once everything's said and done, she rolls up the paper and hands it to Omelas. It's like, make copies, send them out to the local Sissel Rad, House Druin and Bar will need to know, as well as House of Cardas. Uh, we'll need to send uh, an envoy to uh, Kaitain to inform the Lansrad that the situation has changed here within the hierarchy of House Cheshire. We are now plus one herald of House Cheshire, she says, and she uh, motions for you to take a seat at the table uh, for the rest of the security meeting, Archibald. <laughs> and this is where we really get to brass tacks. Uh, Omela is, uh, is obviously concerned about the situation on the moon and wants to know, how, you know, your specific input on how you're going to turn this around because right now that place according to people that they've had on the ground over there looks like a war zone what do you t what do you say to that and also i'm gonna send you a message
since William is sort of out of the loop in this particular context with dealing with these sort of matters, he excuses himself from the situation. Or... Well. <laughs> Obviously, obviously, we're not going to go up there with an army of people and just kill everyone. I don't think that's the right decision to do. I think we need to negotiate with them. And someone, obviously, they're not going to talk. They're only going to talk to the people that have the uh, noble blood. The leaders of the house. Uh, that Elmelis uh, reminds you that the insurgents on the moon have arranged themselves or have organized themselves in such a way that they operate out of cells and they basically just have like one person to speak to and they are refusing to meet with anyone other than uh, the Daphne or Duchess Adeline who is actually injured right now so it's not the best situation for her to be running around. Uh, she literally can't do that. Um, and that's one of the, the points of contention here is that they don't want to give in to their demands, so to speak, because that, number one, that shows that to them, at least, that, oh, they're willing to, you know, bend the knee to us or whatever. We hold, the, we hold all the power now. But also, uh, they don't want to put the, you know, the air or the Duchess herself in a line of fire. If this is some ruse to, to, you know, smoke them out of the castle and potentially hurt them. I agree with you on that one. I don't think those two should go. I do definitely think it should be me. Just because of the fact is, I'm not gonna get shot when I step right in. These people- I admire your confidence, General. It's like, who do you intend to take with you to, to the moon, however? Or do you plan on going on with just a contingent of soldiers that will oversee your interactions with the insurgents? And, and you know, this is kind of like innuendo double talk that Omelis is engaging in right now. He's posing the question at the general, but really he's asking all of you in the room right now, are you willing to let the general go by himself or only with a small contingent of guards to the moon to handle this himself? Or do you not trust them enough to do that? In which case, which one of you will accompany him to snicker? Uh, Daphne definitely wants him to travel with some sort of supervision because, like, this mm. is sort of what we're saying is that he speaks with the voice of the house, so he should travel with someone. So Daphne's willing to go, but I think Lysander will, like, Lock her in a box if she tries. <laughs> yeah, oh, probably. He has a mind for strategy and negotiation. He does. I would, while well, they're looking at who should go, I would briefly look over at Norma, the consort of the current Duchess, who would be the obvious, I'm valuable enough that I'm making a risk to show we're willing to be vulnerable, yeah. but. Also, nobody knows, say, me from a hole in the ground, but she's got plenty of Bene Gesserit skill, and you need at least one on any diplomatic mission. Yeah. 100% accurate, yes. I and it also is a very good. neutral statement to send your Bene Gesserit, because it also means, and we can kill you if it goes wrong. <laughs> I feel like the uh, Norma going would be the appropriate amount of, we're giving face. Hmm. Okay, giving so true face to this. Uh... There's also another no, thing you guys have to think about general. as well. Uh oh, here we go. Because if that does happen, you guys will be taken hostage with me. And that I can probably speak for myself, considering these people are, admire me. I don't know That's how they're going to treat you guys. I think I'd actually be a hostage. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, looks over at the other Benny Gesserit and looks at Archibald and gently asks if he 
was deprived of the benefit of our order's services during his long life, and thus <laughs> not familiar with our ability to survive in situations where we are at a disadvantage for many reasons and viewed with suspicion. Oh. It's said not to be insulting, just that's kind of what it says on the tin. I just want to make sure every know, everyone knows what they're getting into. Very we're well, going General. Behind enemy lines, and that's never a good, and that's never something that is safe. Enemy lines? That well, line says. Hostile lines. Nods. Okay. If you correct yourself, she nods. Um, she gives uh, Daphne and Lysander the uh, the usual sort of uh, room that you are afforded to choose your own people for a particular mission. Uh, so Archibald is like, I'm going on a mission. He doesn't get to choose who goes with him, but you do. So you get to decide who, who accompanies the good general uh, to the moon to try to disable this uh, or defuse this uh, potentially explosive situation. Or gets out of hand. Um, so far, we have Norma. <laughs> uh, Archibald did indicate uh, Pardo, but that's up to you. Yes, I will. I will join this. Yeah. Uh, Daphne is going to be on standby. So she's going to stay on Jabberwock, but if the situation changes and Archibald or Norma or Pardo think, like, her being there would make things better, she'll be ready to leave. Ah, okay. So you're the backup. Okay. So we got Pardo and Norma uh, and Lysander. I'm guessing you're staying behind? Yes. Okay. Fair but enough. he has to stay behind and do the war thing when things inevitably go terribly on the other group. <laughs> right. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Adeline is, is convinced that this is the right course of action to take. Uh, she feels she visibly looks better uh, or more confident at, at the towards the end of the security meeting. She also looks exhausted. Like she's just like she can't wait to be done with this and just like retire and go take a nap or something like that. It just looks like all of this is like like mentally and physically exhausting for her. Uh, so she kind of taps you on the arm, Daphne, and she's like, I trust you to handle the situation with the best of your ability as usual. And it's like, I'm going to uh, try to work on some, work on trying to get these uh, responses back to House Ikaz. I do want to try to make it to this wedding at some point. This could be beneficial to our house. Of course. I, uh, I went. I'll focus on that while Archibald is on Jabberwock. No, on Snicker. I'm actually going to, before we leave, I want to talk to uh, Lady Daphne privately. Ooh, okay. Rant. <laughs> Lysander, I... do you have do you leave those two in the same room by themselves, or? <laughs> uh, Alright, so we can yet. meet in we can meet in one of the gardens. Where you can still have line of sight without necessarily overhearing. Yeah, so basically she's like a hawk just surveying things. I get it. Yeah. Lysander's just kind of like hovering around, <laughs> observing everything. And like, nearby, don't mind of course, me. you have the Jabberwocky and Jungle Cats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <sighs> well, the cats are quite clearly Team Archibald. <laughs> uh, he would consent to a garden meeting. As long as he could make sure that Archibald isn't trying to murder you. <laughs> okay, proceed. Hey, Daphne. Yes? There is, I, want, I wanted to bring up a certain issue I have. Well, we have. This is a house matter. You have my I wanted attention. to bring it up only to you. Because you are the heir, to heir, and the Duchess probably won't even talk to me. She hates me. That's beside the point. 
are you are you familiar with the atomics? I know they exist. Well, it'd be stupid enough not for me not to tell you. Ten months ago, this is the, this is a secret I have. I only have. And if it weren't for the fact that House Cheshire could be demolished from it, I'm telling you. Mm-hmm. Ten months ago, some men uh, with a oh, out of character. What was the device? What I Axiom probe. Okay. Ten months ago, someone came into the broke into the prison. Or the Nixium probe. It was a team of guys. They tortured me for around 10, 12 hours. More like minutes, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Felt like hours. Did. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, they hooked up this Nixium probe and stole and stole some memories from me. Or at least saw some memories from me. They were the locations of all these atomics that House Cheshire has. And it sounded like from what they were doing is that they're going to sell them because they're moving them somewhere. They're going to steal our atomics. Yeah. I know where they all are. Granted, that was 10 months ago. They could be moved by now, but that's a question I don't know. Uh question for Panda. Yes. Uh, did Thea tell us anything about Masum's dream about seeing the Atomics come down? That's entirely up to Norma, because I told her. Right. But I'm uh, not sure what our current policy within the Order is on, yeah, we accidentally quas- a Quasak a Hadarak. I'm not necessarily sure we're going to want one to be the Emperor, so this is going to be a little awkward. Uh... No one would have uh, implied uh, the atomics being a thing to watch out for with uh, the Duchess to verify that they are all still in place. Uh, not telling, not telling the reason. Just you know, Norma doing a. This is something that is uh, that a gesture intuition. All right. Uh, memory. Yeah. So, uh, since Daphne would not know that, uh, she would say to Archibald, "Thank you for telling me. Uh, I will see to the problem immediately." I'll see to your moon immediately. Any walks. Uh, and so, would it be Pardo in charge of the atomics? Hmm. No. So here's the fun part about the House Atomics. Most major houses have them, right? But a few key select people within the house have access to the Atomics, or they know where they're located. Because there's something called the Guild Piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, Generally, when uh, a house wants to move forces, or in this case, Atomics, from one place to the other, uh, the, the Guild does so quietly. Uh, so you can have you and your enemies can be sitting on the same ship and they can't tell anybody that this is so because that would violate that guild piece. It's a very important part of the Great Convention. kind of keeps everything together. Um, so when a house wants to move and put away their nuclear weapons effectively, the guild does so and keeps it quiet, which, which means only a select few people within the house know of the Atomics location. One of them is this man, mm-hmm. Archibald. The other one was the Duke, their grandfather. And the other one who knows is Omelis Dorothier, the advisor to House Cheshire. And that's where we'll stop. Oh, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how you were going to react to that. Okay. <laughs> That's all the time we have for this session. I hope everyone here and those watching enjoyed the show. We'll continue our adventure into the Imperium next Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
If you enjoyed tonight's program, feel free to check out our all other awesome adventures and terrifying tales. Tuesday, Steve is running Twilight 2000, and Space Flood Pajamas is doing an awesome Mecha Hat campaign, so tune into that. Wednesdays, the awesomeness continues with the One Ring, Four Swords of the North. Rachel runs the new Vampire the Requiem Brood game, Rebellion, which is followed by Pathfinder Undying on Thursdays. Fridays brings us the continuation of Rachel's epic Mass of Nyarlathotep campaign, followed by Patty's Scarred Lands, Dracula Genesis Season 2. Saturday has Harry running Warhammer, Wrath and Glory, uh, Martyrs of Persepolis. And Sunday, our very own Kisama runs the hot new 5e setting Plangia with the current campaign to rival the gods, which is followed by Cult Divinity Lost, Phantasmagoria. In the After Dark category, we have Solemn Veil up next later this evening at SCP The RPG Memetic Hazard on Saturdays, both beginning at 11.55 Eastern Standard Time. Now, for those of you who uh, stayed uh, this far, it's time to vote for favorites. Everybody in this game can select another player as their favorite for that session for any reason. Uh, recipients will receive a reward in the form of an advancement point. Uh, for viewers, voting is open as well. You can choose a new favorite each week for all of our shows, but you have to be quick as voting ends as soon as our closing reel finishes. So be sure to cast your votes in the Twitch chat as soon as you can. Recipients will receive a reward in the form of a re-roll for one or all of their dice pool. Beginning with um, Key, uh, who played uh, Pardo Reed this evening. Who's your favorite and why? And where can people find you online? Uh, they can try to find me, but I'll find them first on Twitter at True Kisama. Uh, yeah, and I am Kisama. I played Pardo. My favorite for this session. <laughs> Has to be Norma. Ah. Quick movement. <laughs> mm, for the quick movement and then the whole fiasco surrounding the footage. <laughs> That was a good, that was a great scene. Excellent. Uh, Ambrose, who played uh, Lysander, uh, where can people find you online and who's your favorite? Hey, everybody, you can find me online at AmChangeling because it me, AmChangeling. You can also find me on Etsy at Neat and Co Designs. And my god, <laughs> they're all good. Yeah, I'm, this is... I don't... Mm, eh. Crap. <laughs> Decisions. Yeah, yeah. I'm, Who made you smile? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Who made you frown? Ooh, you better. us. There you go. <laughs> um, oh god. I'm I'm going to I'm going to give it to Jared for the interesting way that uh Archibald solved the mm. first insurgency experienced. Excellent. I got to give some credit to uh, our good game master cuz he was the one that gave me the idea. And then I just like flew with it. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, Panda, who played, uh, Thea Kalu. Like, Thea Kalu. Not Kale, but Kalu. <laughs> uh, where can people find you online? Who's your favorite? Um, hi. You can otherwise know me as Panda, and you can find me as at Veppels on Twitter and Instagram. A lot of good choices as usual. Um, it's really a toss up with a couple of people that really stood out this time. I would have to say that Pardo was on fire this time, so they get it, but um, a special mention goes to Archibald, who, despite being completely locked out of the meeting, managed to manipulate his way into the room where it happens and put himself in the position to basically be in charge of everything and get a promotion. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Devin, who played uh, Norma this evening, who's your favorite and why, and where can people find you online? Uh find me online at Sword of Sully, and I'm gonna have to give it to Pardo for gutting a face dancer before everyone else, because one-shotting him and then saving the footage, yeah. 
I saved the footage, thank you. You were you had to take it, bro. Don't even don't even. You were just an accomplice. If, if 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 he hadn't one shotted this face dancer, it never would have happened. Yeah, but you had a freaking knife to his throat. It was going to get deleted because you guys were bickering. Yeah, the very you. next thing I was going to say was, fix it to prove that you're you. <laughs> fix it, nice. Uh, Jared, who of course played uh, General Archibald, uh, who, tell the good people who where they can find you online. Who's your favorite? Oh, um, my name is Jared. You can find me at the Real Life Jared on your on the World Wide Web, and um, I played Arch Archibald today. I made some moves. I feel like I made some mistakes as well. Comes with the That's how the game goes. Sometimes it goes in my favor. <laughs> Risk without reward. Ah. Risk isn't always without reward. That's true. But Who's your favorite? My favorite. I have. I do have to give it to Pardo. He did very. Actually, no. I'll give Pardo my honorable mention. I gotta give it to Norma for oh. being Norma. <laughs> for being Norma. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, and last but not least, of course. Uh, who played uh, Lady Daphne. Uh, where can people find you online, and who's your favorite for this evening? Uh, hello. Yeah, you can find me. No, no. There Indeed. we go. You can find me online pretty much everywhere. It's Stolen Fires. Uh, you'll see me in about half an hour uh, as, as we play another chapter of Solemn Veil. Vale. Uh, I'm going to be an IT nerd slash accountant. Should be a lot of fun. Uh... Yeah, and then, uh, as mentioned, I'm running Vampire on Thursdays and Cthulhu on Fridays here. Uh, just started the Vampire Chronicle. Uh, I have high hopes for it. I'm also having a lot of fun running Masks of Nyarlathotep. Uh, as far as my vote... Oh, god damn it. Um... I'm gonna have to give it to Ambrose for Lysander always being so laser-focused on his duty. <laughs> It's, it's fun to play play with and play off of, especially because, like, I'm the one making it difficult for him to actually do his duty. <laughs> I mean, you made it easy. Run away from. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for being uh, good to each other. I I'm, of course, Eric at Mar Maron Recluse Online. Uh, you can find me here tonight, later, also, for uh, Solon Vale, and then tomorrow for Twilight 2000. Big thanks, as always, to our patrons for supporting what we do. If you want to be awesome and do the same, check out our Patreon page on patreon.com slash Tales and keep up with what we're doing with the calendar on vocaltales.com. And thanks to you, our, our viewers and fans, for tuning in. As always, never sit with your back to the wall. Always remember your shield emitter and be careful who you trust. We're in the game of houses. Nothing is truly as it seems. <laughs>